morning, we have the sentencing for Hannah Gutierrez Reed today. Now, her trial happened about a couple weeks ago, and she was found guilty for, um, you know, for the deaths of um, for the death of Helena Hutchins and for the injury of Joel Souza. Um, she was charged with manslaughter and she was facing about 18 months. Now, there's been a lot of things that's been happening since the verdict came out. Some really interesting things. Uh, first off. We got jailhouse calls and whenever we get jailhouse calls, it usually looks pretty bad for the defendants because I don't know, maybe they just forget that these calls are recorded. Maybe they don't care. Maybe they think it's going to go under the radar. Sometimes they speak in code, you know, the Adelsons, but I don't know. Usually I would, it's my understanding. Like if you're on a jailhouse calls, isn't there like a message that keeps repeating themselves, telling people that like, Hey, this call is recorded. This call may be recorded. I don't know. I would assume it would say in the beginning, definitely uh, throughout the call maybe, but maybe they just forget, but we have the jailhouse calls and they don't look very good. And her sentencing is today. So I'm assuming the state's probably going to bring it up today. Um, you know, when they're talking about how many, uh, months they recommend i think the state wants to max 18 months i think that's a recommended i think the defense is like ah no give her like probation or something like that but i wanted to watch something i don't know should we watch it before yeah we have like 15 minutes i think we have time hi debbie how are you doing today but there is a state's response that i read last night and it is wild it summarizes the jailhouse calls that were made um some of the things that hannah reed was saying and apparently she was attacking the judge the jury not a good idea um she's apparently trying to get the victim's family to come in and maybe vouch for her so that's a little bit confusing to me because i don't know if she has a good relationship with the victim's family i don't know if she has a good relationship with joel Souza's family helena hutchins family i i, I would assume they wouldn't want to come in and speak for her on her behalf you know but i don't know a lot of crazy stuff going on here but i want to read the state's response maybe after the sentencing happens um it's a lot. It's uh, it's a little bit crazy. Oh, cool. The court is the video is working. I hope you guys are doing well. Hi, Dave. Hello. Hi, Citizen Cardigan. Hello, Court Smith. And then also um, there is another charge that Hannah Reed has, and she's got more court stuff coming her way. It's not just this done. It's there's another charge that she's got, um, and it does involve a gun. So very interesting. And we're definitely going to take a look at that. Hi, Kiki. How are you doing today? But she's got another um, court appearance for the other unrelated charge. Uh, this is for unlawful carrying of a firearm in a licensed liquor establishment. I didn't hear about this. I didn't see any articles covering this, but she has a hearing date on August. And then, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it says jury selection. <laughs> so is she going to have to go through this all over again? Oh boy, um, Jason Bowles is going to have uh, some work to do. Hi, Shay. Hi, lady. Hello, hello. Hi, Morton. Uh, good morning, everyone. Yeah, we're streaming live on Twitch and on YouTube. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Oh boy. But yeah, it's it's a lot, man. It's some crazy stuff. I, last night I got back from Austin and I was like, you know what? Let me just see what's up. Cool. What's, let me see what, what's going on in like the true crime world. Okay, let me just pop in really quick. And then I just got sucked in for a couple hours. Okay, there was a lot of things to read. There's a lot of things to catch up on. But I don't know. I hope you guys have a good weekend. We went to Austin, Texas, and I forgot how humid it is in Texas. I forgot. Even though I think the humidity was considered to be kind of low in Texas this weekend. But when I went out there, my hair just instantly just went like bleh. <laughs> it is a mess. Maybe she'll have time to figure it out. Hopefully she's I still consider her as someone who's young. I think what she's 25, 26. Young, you know, but not very smart kind of arrogant maybe i i don't know because we didn't get to hear from her during the trial um she didn't go up there she didn't testify which is probably good that she didn't go up there and testify jason bowles was probably like you know what hannah maybe you should sit this one out maybe you should this you should sit this one out so i thought maybe you know there's been maybe she's had time to reflect maybe she does feel bad but it seems like after the verdict happened uh you know she went after the jury the judge and like I said, if she doesn't have a good relationship with the victim's family, her trying to get her legal team to reach out to them and get them to talk on her behalf for sentencing, it just seems really out of touch. <laughs> I it, it just doesn't look good. It just doesn't look good at all. Um, I just don't know what people are thinking, in, especially in jailhouse calls. Like, what are you thinking in jailhouse calls? You just must not care at all. I don't know. You just might not give a shit. Uh, Ronnie says, was she sentenced yet? No, she's going to be sentenced in about like 10 minutes. Um, 
after we go through her sentencing, I'm going to read you guys the state's response. Actually, let's, I think we have time to just watch this right here. Um, this was released about a day ago and I'm going to be at the halfway mark because this is where I thought things got interesting. And I was like, wait a second, I need to do some research. So after the verdict happened, um, they, of course, uh, we saw this during the verdict or after the verdict where Hannah's lawyers, they wanted her to kind of like be uh, released while, you know, pending sentencing. Uh, the judge denied that. The judge was like, nope, uh, we're going to take her in custody right now. Let's go. Judge denied that. And then afterwards, um, her defense team tried to put in this uh, motion for like a mistrial because apparently there's something about the jury instructions that may have been confusing. Judge denies that. And they're like, well, you know what? Like she should be released while, you know, we have like maybe like an appeal coming in. Judge is like, nope, we're going to keep her locked in. <laughs> Judge is like, nope, 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 nope. But I want to go to the halfway point and listen to it. Florida, no, I've been to Florida before. Florida is wild. I don't know how you guys do your hairs in Florida, okay? I got to get like the extra five times hold. It's it's wild. But you know what? I think um when I go to countries or states that are high humidity, that's like super hot, I just give up. I don't, just don't wear makeup. Don't wear makeup, just don't do your hair. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people get all glammed up and stuff like that and then go to these like high humidity places. Everything just melts off your face. Like I feel like my face just melts and then it gets like shift to the side. So my eyebrows be like over here, my cheeks be over here, my eye. <laughs> eyelashes be dangling <laughs> anyways y'all so i went us into halfway point and um after the sentencing i want to read the state's response because it is wild it is crazy in taylor the problem in taylor was they went beyond and or seven Hold on, i'm gonna forward through this part so this is the state responding um about you know the defendant asking for a mistrial because of jury instructions and she's responding to that but i want to get to the part where like towards the end right here of which were absolutely sufficient for involuntary manslaughter. It's my recollection that in closing, what I invited the jury to do, uh, and this is a little bit different than what Mr. Bowles is suggesting to the court, what I explained to the court is you've got 12 and 12A, and between instruction 12 and 12A, the, the, there is un, unanimity is not required. I don't believe that I suggested to the jury that the options within 12A did not require unanimity. Uh, that's my recollection of my closing. I can see Mr. Bull shaking his head. Uh, we we haven't had the, the the reason that when I had to watch something else before I lost too much brain power. When that happens to me, I just watch Korean drama and I lose more brain cells. <laughs> Mr. Lewis filed his I love uh, Korean response dramas. and he indicated that that the defense didn't object to this was because he didn't have uh, the benefit of the audio and the transcript. Uh, and that's one of my concerns is. The defendant uh, had the benefit of the audio and the transcript when they filed their initial two-page motion, but they certainly haven't shared it with us. Uh, so I I'm happy to provide. Oh, yeah. So she goes after the defense for filing a two-page motion. And she's like, how are you going to file a two-page motion <laughs> asking for a mistrial or something like that? Um, it just usually you expect a lot more pages. You know, two just seems really short. <laughs> Uh, additional I haven't found this two-page motion yet, by the way. <laughs> if I can find it and read it, I think it'd be really interesting. Hello, Bleep. How's it going? ...on this if the court uh, thinks that that's necessary. Um, in terms of the unanimity issue and the Godoy case, Taylor actually, as Mr. Bowles pointed out, upholds uh, Godoy and the argument that, or, or the principle, that unanimity is not required when there are two alternatives. And in this case, we had two alternatives, that being 12 and 12A. Um, so... While I appreciate the fact that the Taylor case may give guidance in the future uh, to how to properly construct jury instructions that have and or separators, the Taylor case actually has language that specifically supports what we did in this trial. Okay, so she's getting there. Uh, Citizen Cardigan says, at first I had sympathy for her, not anymore. I did too. Um, initially when I heard about this, I was like, dude, like, this feels really unfair. She's young, you know, made me really inexperienced. Maybe everyone on the set was a bully, but then we watched the trial and I was like, I changed my mind. There are only being two options in 12A separated by and or. So I'm a little confused uh, about what the defense thinks the strength of their argument is, because when you read paragraph 14, Taylor actually is supportive of the way that we did it in Ms. Gutierrez's case. Uh, so for those reasons, we would object and we would ask the court to deny uh, defendant's motion. And if the court has any specific questions. Yeah, I, I really like Carrie, too. I feel like she's so good at explaining herself. She's like straight to the point and she just goes for the attack. Like, I don't know. I, I love Carrie. <laughs>
questions for me or any concerns. I think Jason Bowles, um, Hannah's defense attorney, did a good job too. But I just really liked the way she did things um, and made me like, I felt, I don't know, because sometimes when lawyers speak in their like you know in their jargon you get a little bit lost you're just like what the hell are they talking about i feel like she did a really good job at explaining things in a way where it's like oh okay i understand exactly where you're going at i'm not like i'm not like lost and like trying to figure out what you're trying to say and trying to like weave through <laughs> doing like mental gymnastics or anything like that i'm happy to address those thank you reply uh yes judge um first judge the opinion in taylor does say in paragraph 9 and 16 it doesn't limit that language to to four propositions the specific language in 9 and 16 is the console case when two or more different or inconsistent acts. That's specifically stated. And that's what Justice Vigil is saying in Taylor is that the unanimity principle is the problem. Uh, the unanimity principle as to which different act. So it does correct and confusing in Taylor. She specifically said in closing, six of you can find one act and six in another. And we have those tapes. Uh, all of us you know, can request those tapes so we can get that transcribed if the court wants that and we can make that part of the record. But that the problem is this jury was invited to find a non-unanimous act and just conglomerate them. That's the, the problem that Taylor announced. All right, thank you, counsel. So I do agree that your uh, motion was very sparse and it just focused your motion for a new trial. Two-page motion. <laughs> it was very sparse and it just focused on the and or and because we had a jury instruction in and or, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Gutierrez was entitled to a new trial. It wasn't until your reply where you flushed out um, um, things, issues that you had already stated um, regarding the uh, unanimity aspect of things. Um, I have read uh, Taylor, I've read Bidet, I've uh, read Consul, I've read uh, very many cases. I'm very aware of what occurred at trial. I'm very aware of the discussions that occurred on, on um, regarding the jury instructions. And I'm denying your motion, Mr. Bowles, because I do not think that uh, Taylor requires a new trial. Uh, in this case, I think that the uh, issues in this case, uh, the jury instruction in this case are distinguishable, distinguishable from what, uh, what happened in Taylor. I'm not going to, um, I'm going to provide a written order outlining my reasons so that there's no misstatements of what I'm uh, to make an oral determination. So I'm going to do a written order, but I wanted to let you know that I'm denying your motion for a new trial. I will put it in an order. You should get that on Monday. And um, we are staying the course on the sentencing. To address this at sentencing or to address it now, which was to consider release of Ms. Gutierrez-Reed uh, pending uh, an appeal and a writ that we would take for guidance from the appeals court and Supreme Court. And I just wanted to add to that, she didn't have any violations uh, pending trial. She takes care of her father who has been diagnosed with leukemia. Um, she works um, and she has been in counseling. So she hasn't done anything wrong. She's not a danger or a flight risk. And I think there's um, an appellate issue that we have stated that we, we will raise and a potential Supreme Court writ. And I, I just think it's unfair if the state thinks um, her working might be BS. There's any chance of the, uh -huh. the Court of Appeals or Supreme Court seeing it differently that she served her whole sentence uh, on the chance that it could be reversed. So I'm just asking the court to consider that based on all those grounds and the fact that she hasn't had any violations. Ms. Marcy. Well, okay, listen to her response, okay? Because she's, I <laughs> listen to her response. We do oppose uh, Ms. Gutierrez's release. Um, I, if this were like a motion to review conditions of release, um, I certainly would have been able to address my concerns with regard to Ms. Gutierrez and potential release. Um, I, I'm opposed to it. Does the court want me to go into, um, I, I mean, I actually asked Mr. How do I move the subtitles? Polls for, for uh, proof of Ms. Gutierrez's employment history uh, during the time that the case was pending and any counseling and treatment that she has uh, completed or participated in. To date, I don't believe he's provided me anything. What what happened? Mr. Bowles, what's going on with your emails? Uh, so while Mr. Bowles wants to make these statements to the court this morning, these are things that I requested from Mr. Bowles, I think, over a week ago. I did it almost immediately after the trial so that I could be thoughtful in terms of coming up with a sentencing recommendation at the sentencing on April 15th, and I've received absolutely nothing. In terms of uh, Ms. Gutierrez's uh, full compliance with her conditions of release, I, I think there are some arguments to be made there if the court wants me to make them now. Judge is like, no, 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 I got this. <laughs> the jury found uh, Ms. Gutierrez read guilty. She is incarcerated at this point. She's facing incarceration time. Keep in mind, there was a death that the jury determined was caused by her. So I'm not releasing her. All right. That's actually exactly what the judge said too during, um, right after verdict. Oh, Thank people you. are coming into the courtroom now. All right, let's switch on over. People are coming in to the courtroom. Oh my God, the chat's moving fast. I'm going to hide the chat. Boom. If she was working, she ain't no mo. I was supposed to be doing things today, but I can't get out of bed. Uh, are you sick today? You're pulling a genie during laundry. I did laundry last night. Every time when I come home from vacation, I just go straight to the washer and just dump everything in there. 
I wonder how everyone in the courtroom is doing. Oh, someone over here got a little bow tie. Oh, here it comes in Mr. Bowles. There's Hannah. Um, oh, actually, um, the woman with the black hair, that's his paralegal. I think it was in uh, one of the state's um, motions where they referred to her as uh, Jason Bowles paralegal. Wait, did she get her hair did today? How is her hair so curly? Or does she have naturally curly hair? Love her. Her suit is so chic. <laughs> yeah, she was always very fashionable. Uh, what is this case about? Are you familiar with um, the Rust movie and Alec Baldwin? Got the jail rollers made with TP. You know, I remember back in the day, um, the beginning days of like YouTube beauty stuff. I remember Michelle Fan. She would do uh, these like random ass like beauty hacks. I remember it was like using paper bags to curl your hair or something like that. I don't know. Using cat litter on your face. I don't know. It was like some crazy stuff like that. So you know what? You can get pretty creative. Uh, Miss Morrissey's already up there. Got the judge. Jason Bowles. I wonder what they're talking about. Oh, that too. If we're at a timeshare, I'll wash our clothes. Yes, same. Um, if I'm at an Airbnb, I'll do the same thing. If there's a laundry, I'll do all of our laundry. And then we'll just go back with a suitcase full of like yummy, delicious clothes. <laughs> No, I only know about rest of programming language. Uh, okay, let me try to quickly recap it. So Alec Baldwin um, was in this movie, Russ. He was a producer. He was also the main lead actor. And there was a gun that was discharged. Um, it was the gun that he was holding. He was practicing um, like a draw shot. And the gun actually went off. It went through the cinematographer, Helena Hutchins, killed her. And then it went through Joel Souza. It was a single bullet. He was uh, seriously injured. Now, she is being charged, Hannah Reed, because she is the armorer. She's the one who's in charge of the guns. Oh, I think it's starting right now. Charge of the guns, charge of checking the bullets to make sure the guns are good, the bullets aren't real, stuff like that. And they end up finding out that the bullet that went through was actually a live bullet. So she's been charged. Um, she's had a guilty verdict, and now we're at her sentencing. This is Hannah Gutierrez, D101CR 202340. Party state their name. Uh, Carrie Morrissey and Jason Lewis on behalf of the state of New Mexico. Good morning, Your Honor. Jason Bowles and Carmela Cisneros are here for Mr. Terrace Reed, who is also present. All right, thank you. All right, this is a sentencing. Let's proceed. Um... Let's get the microphone on. Uh, Your Honor, I, I wasn't sure exactly what recommendation would be appropriate in this unprecedented case until last week when I completed the review of Ms. Gutierrez's jail calls. <laughs> uh, the jail house calls are bad, I'm telling you guys. It was my sincere hope during this process that there would be some moment when Ms. Gutierrez took responsibility, um, expressed some level of remorse that was genuine, and that moment has never come. Ms. Gutierrez continues to refuse to accept responsibility for her role in the death of Helena Hutchins. Um, rather than accept responsibility, she has chosen to place blame on the witnesses who testified against her. Mm. Me, you, the jury. She said the witnesses were lying on the stand. Only about two or three of the expert witnesses were telling the truth, she said. She said the judge was paid off. Um, I forgot what she said about the prosecutor. The set medic. The oh, yeah. She blamed the paramedics. 
She blamed apparently the kid actor who grabbed the gun. <laughs> I'm telling y'all, it was it was pretty bad. Witnesses who testified against her. Me, you, the jurors, the set medic, and the paramedics who tried to save Ms. Hutchins' life. Her jail calls, and there were probably close to 200 of them. Tell us who Ms. Gutierrez really is. And in the, in the state's opinion, uh, the content and tone of her calls demonstrates that Ms. Gutierrez should not receive any type of a reduced sentence. Helena Hutchins died due to a cascade of safety violations that began with Ms. Gutierrez introducing live rounds to the movie set, loading one into a prop gun, telling the members of the crew that it was a cold gun, thereby ensuring that it would make its way into the hands of Mr. Baldwin. That conduct, absent responsibility or remorse, is deserving of a sentence of 18 months in the Department of Corrections with a designation as a serious violent offender. And that is what the state will be requesting today. Um, and those are the only arguments I intend to make in terms of sentencing. I would like to move into the presentation uh, of the witnesses who would like to address the court on behalf of Ms. Hutchins and her family. Thank you. Uh, I would like to start Carrie sounds so disappointed, LOL. Yeah, she does. Start with Craig Mizrahi. Mr. Mizrahi. My name is Craig Mizrahi and I was Helena's agent. I was compelled to be present today. Okay, to your mic on. Can you yes. talk a little into the, more, the microphone? More into the mic? Is that better? Yeah, yes. it's, it's okay. unfortunate. I was man. compelled to be present today to express the impact of the loss of Helena, who was a cherished friend, wife, mother, and artist, senselessly lost on October 21st, 2021. I was first introduced to Helena when a mutual friend sent me samples of her cinematography. I was pleasantly surprised to see how mature and refined it was, especially given the small budgets she was working with. I imagined what she could do if given the time and resources of a large film, and I instantly knew I wanted to work with her. When Is she trying to look remorseful now? I don't know, Van. Like, eh, maybe a little bit too late, you know? You should have kind of echoed that during your jailhouse calls. What stood out for me was her passion, her intense preparation, her resourcefulness and creativity on set, and the kindness and generosity she showed to all those she worked with. In getting to know her husband, Matt, it was clear that he and their son, Andros, supported every career move she made and accepted the very difficult reality that she would have to travel for work very often. This rare combination of talent, work ethic, collaboration, and family support was what truly set her apart. In 2021, Helena's star continued to rise. Her name was mentioned around Hollywood as someone to watch, and just two weeks before she began on Rust, Helena got her first meeting on a big studio film. She came in a close second for that job, and instead of focusing on why it didn't go her way, she felt great confidence that she was finally playing with the big boys. When Rust came her way, she felt excited for the visual challenge that a Western would bring. She enjoyed meeting the director, Joel, and believed in his vision for the film, so we went for it. Two days before she died, Helena called me. It was very late, but she wanted to say she just had dinner with Joel and Alec, and she was so happy to be working with them. She felt the film would be a great next step and was excited for what was to come in 2022. I agreed and said, sleep well, tomorrow's another big day. That was the last time I spoke to Helena. October 21st was a fateful day that would change the lives of so many. Most of all, Andros, who at nine years old, would have to somehow comprehend the terrifying reality of losing his mother in this way. In the time that's passed, while the pain persists, the circumstances surrounding the disaster... I, I, I guess I just don't believe her crying now because they brought up Helena so many times um, during the trial. And there were parts where, uh, when they mentioned the actual shooting happened, where I saw a little bit of emotion coming from her. 
But this type of motion, we definitely did not see. Like this right here, this would have been great for her, I guess, during trial. We just did not see this. We saw there were parts where she was like, it looked like she was like kind of like upset maybe when they talked about Helena getting shot, but it was that's it. This right here, I, I don't know. I'm <laughs> I'm a little bit confused. Maybe she's like, shit, I fucked up on the jailhouse calls. Like I really should show remorse. Remember, the jailhouse calls were just um uh pretty recent. If it was like from over a year ago, I could be like, okay, well, maybe she's had time to reflect and, you know, kind of like change and feel remorseful, but I'm a little bit confused. What's going on here? Force upon us so many questions with one in particular above all, how could this have happened? It's my opinion that generally speaking, film producers are responsible to ensure the cast and crew members hired are experienced enough to handle their jobs. And when it comes to hiring the armor on a Western, I believe safety is the only job. So when the producers hired someone with virtually no experience to not only be the armorer, but also the assistant prop master, two very challenging positions in their own right, they made a crucial decision to put sa the safety of their cast and crew on the back burner. As for Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, it's my opinion that she should not have held either position, much less both, but that once accepted, the responsibility should have been taken more seriously. Sadly, it wasn't, and we all know the result. Mm -hmm. Since that terrible day, I've spoken with hundreds of producers, film executives, and directors about how we can come together as an industry to make sets safer from gun violence. But the truth is that if Ms. Gutierrez-Reed and the producers of Rust simply followed the decades-old written guidelines for the film industry, specifically the use of firearms and ammunition, this tragedy would never have happened. In that sense, I hope we can all agree that this was not a simple accident. It was a chain of events that led to the killing of someone, and that chain would have been broken if the armor was doing the job she was mm -hmm. hired to do. I often think about what Helena's future would have been, and it makes me smile. I can assure you it would have been bright, filled with spending time with Andros and watching him grow up. She would have been able to help her support her family in Ukraine, especially when they needed her most through the horror of war. She would have traveled the world shooting beautiful images and eventually becoming the director that would change hearts and minds with her poignant and purposeful storytelling. In the end, she'd likely finish her career as she started at the American Film Institute, getting back to the next generation of, of filmmakers. Sadly, we'll never know because Helena's life was taken away from us much too soon. So today we stand determined to seek justice for Helena, to hold accountable those responsible for her death, and to ensure that such a tragedy never occurs again. I want to thank Ms. Morrissey and her team for having me here today, and thank you, Your Honor, for your service in the case. Thank you. Amelia Mendieta. My name is Amelia Mendieta. I was one of Helena's best friends and one of her colleagues and a classmate of hers at the American Film Institute Conservatory. Helena and I met on August 2013 in the registration line on our first day at the American Film Institute Conservatory. I was quietly suffering through a small bout of imposter syndrome and desperately trying to hide my nerves about officially starting the cinematography program. I don't think I was hiding them very well because this joyful, energetic woman bounced right over to me and invited me out to lunch. We then piled into her RAV4, already chock full of film gels and diffusion that almost hid the baby seat in the back from view, and off we went. After a quick burrito and some pastries, we headed back to campus for our first orientation sessions. We were friends ever since. But that was Lena, a joyful soul who could just as easily strike up a friendship as she could capture a beautiful image. Even while at AFI, Helena stood out as an exceptional artist and cinematographer. She was creative and ambitious and quickly became well known for her skills and insistent pursuit of excellence. The first time I got to work with her on her, was on her second film on her first year. I was on our camera team. Her love and passion for lighting was evident, and you could tell that she was masterful in her approach even then. I'm pretty sure she used every single light on the grip and lighting truck, but she used them, used them well. It's also the film where I broke a blue streak filter that she had borrowed from one of her classmates as I was rushing to get it to her. As I showed her the, blue sh the filter shards, apologizing profusely because I felt I had ruined her project, I could see she was disappointed, not at me, but at the fact that she would have to rethink her meticulously planned creative approach. A feat she accomplished as she went along with the rest of the day. As I was profusely apologizing a rap yet again, she pulled me into a big hug and said, Emmy, it's just a filter. They break. Friendships don't break over a filter. 
Despite the great filter incident in the first year, we went on to collaborate on most projects at AFI and beyond. At first, we crewed for each other on our first year films, our visual essays, and our first feature films. After that, as our careers grew, we leaned on each other for emotional and technical support. She even stepped in front of the camera for a music video I shot and directed, despite her aversion to being on that end of the lens, like most cinematographers. But only for you, Emmy, and only this once, she quipped. As she stared down my gaffer, sweating on the sidelines with a stare that read, I know where that light should go, and you better not put it where it should be. I loved being on her sets or just talking with her about what she was going to do because she was always trying something new, something innovative. She was luminous and endlessly curious. Helena would research how she wanted to accomplish something and make it happen. She had this uncanny ability to balance her career ambitions, her family life, and still lead a thriving social life. I admired and still admire that. I have no idea how she did it. I've always held her in high esteem as a classmate and colleague, but to me, she was first and foremost one of my closest friends in grad school and beyond. We were able to confide and trust in each other as we navigated the challenges of being women in cinematography. That extended to confiding in each other about navigating our personal and professional lives in the film industry at large. One of the beautiful things about our friendship is that we could just as easily wax poetic about the goat cheese salad at the cute brunch spot we had trekked out to over in Venice Beach, or the chromatic aberrations of the lenses we had used on one of our last projects that you really, you know, had given the story some character. But really what I remember her most for was her adventurous and generous spirit. As our lives and careers grew and we got busier, we'd try to meet up for a meal every month or so. It was often lunch, followed by a brisk walk, and usually ending with a coffee and pastry. She had a big sweet tooth. Whenever we would sit down to eat, she'd always look at the dessert menu first. She favored pastries. With That's me. I always do that. Sometimes I'm like, I don't want to eat it at this restaurant unless they have a good dessert menu. Chocolate, but she liked cookies too. I make decorated sugar cookies for my friends on Christmas, dropping them off the second week of December. Hello. Every year without fail, not even an hour after I would drop off hers at her house, she texts text me pictures of the empty cookie bag, followed by some of her and her son happily eating them in one, all in one sitting. Sometimes her son would come along with us on our outings, bouncing with energy. Her spirit mirrored in him. Her little man, she would call him. Her husband and her son were her boys, and she often spoke of them lovingly. Helena was proud of being a mom and often spoke about how the experience changed her life, sometimes even egging me on to have kids whenever I did find a partner. And motherhood was important to her, but I think people were important to her, and she prioritized them. A lesson I've taken to heart since her passing and a balance that most of us in the industry struggle to achieve on a daily basis sometimes. Helena was also a social butterfly, the quintessential extrovert that had a knack for somehow going to every single event she was invited to and being bright and bubbly and charismatic. Most of her friends were introverts, though, myself included. We'd like to joke that she had collected a small gaggle of us along the way and made sure we showed up to these events, too. She would call you up whenever to talk to you about going to some event and um, one that my own little introvert heart maybe would have not dared gone otherwise. <laughs> And she would make sure you weren't left alone. She made a point to take care of us and include us. I appreciate that. It was, still is, so hard to come out of my shell, and she made things easier socially. Now, whenever I go to an event and I'm doubting whether I should go, I ask myself, what would Helena do? The answer is usually go. Late in the summer of 2021, I got a call from her. I was prepping for my third feature film that I was starting filming in a week away, and I hadn't heard from her much since I knew she had been a different project in Canada for most of the summer. I'm at LAX, she said happily. Do you have any suggestions of where I can have good food in Santa Fe? She knew I had family in New Mexico at the time and had spoken lovingly about New Mexican cuisine before. What are you doing in New Mexico? I asked, pouring out a small list of recommendations. I'm shooting a Western. She sounded really excited. <laughs> we have a summary of the calls, um, but not the actual calls. I think um, several news outlets have reached out to the state to release those calls, so maybe we'll get them later. It's been a dream for both of us to shoot genre films. It's so hard to land a genre job sometimes, and she has a soft spot for both westerns and hard sci-fi. I was really excited for her, too, and we reveled at her, reveled at her good fortune on the phone. It has horses and gunfights, and we're shooting out in the desert. It's a huge stepping stone for me. It's going to be so much fun, she said excitedly, and she felt it. That it could be the project that could actually help her career propel forward. Little did we know that it would be the project that killed her. 
I often think about that moment, her excitement, her joy at embarking at this new adventure. I think about how hard she worked to get there, to get that opportunity. It kills me a little inside. The last time we spoke was the day before Russ started shooting. I called her before because a friend of mine gifted me four tickets to Disneyland that would expire by the end of the year. And I thought it would be a really nice gesture to invite Helena and her boys to the park for the day. She seemed excited about going to the park. She hadn't been in a while and felt it could be a good break after the shoot. She mentioned pre-production had been a bit hectic and stressful, but nothing that seemed out of the ordinary in the independent film world. I've since begun to question what is and isn't normal and what should be happening and shouldn't. But I was fresh off my own low-budget feature experience and had a bit of the blues regarding some of my own challenges with that shoot. I confided my doubts in my career with her, my insecurities at the moment. Just another bout of imposter syndrome. She got called to a last-minute meeting. She had to go. Emmy, you're so young and so talented. I have no doubt that you'll make it in this industry. I believe in you. I believe you're an amazing cinematographer in person. Please remember that. Gotta go. We'll talk soon. Love you. This is Helena's best friend. Uh, her, her agent spoke earlier. Those were the last four words she ever said to me. I believe in you. Those four words will forever echo in my soul. They're a bright light in the darkness of this whole situation. They keep me going when times get tough. And times have been tough. I was working at a news station in Sacramento, California on October 21st, 2021, but I heard the news through the grapevine. One of my mentors called me to tell me something had happened on a set in New Mexico. They wanted to know if I'd spoken to Helena. I had not. I was able to get in contact with her husband who confirmed the worst. I confirmed the news to another one of our mentors. I heard his heart break over the phone too. I sat alone in the darkness of my apartment for hours, sobbing uncontrollably. My wonderful, generous, adventurous friend was gone. Killed on a set because a live bullet that wasn't a prop gun. It dawned on me. Someone didn't do their job right. A yep. lot of someones didn't do their job right. I'm also a director of photography. I trained at the same school, graduated the same year, got the same degree. We belong to the same organizations, went to the same networking, networking events, pursue the art of visual storytelling with the same passion. I've been on sets with guns. I've been on sets where blanks were fired at my camera. I know what an armorer's job is. I know the safety procedures that must be followed. And as more and more details of the case came out, it boggled my mind how many of these procedures had been either blatantly disregarded or not followed at all. Helena's death is the result of a massive system failure where many links of the chain were loose or faulty and they all failed her, all of them. But it all boils down to a very simple question. Why was there a live bullet on set? A live bullet should never have made this way onto the set, let alone the gun, full stop. And that- Exactly. What made me interested about this case? Um, well, when this entire thing went down, there was such a huge debate on Twitch and I just want to know who was right. So that's why I wanted to watch the trial and see for myself. It's where Hannah Gutierrez read as the armor on rust fail Helena. It was her job to check the guns, check the bullets, and make sure that the set was safe. I feel like that was a little bit of a head nod from her, like, no, it wasn't me. Very simple question. Why was there a live bullet on set? A live bullet should never have made this way onto the set, let alone the gun. Full stop. And that is where Hannah Gutierrez read as the armor on rust fail Helena. It was her job to check the guns, check the bullets, and make sure that the set was safe. Yeah, I feel like that was a little bit of like a head nod, like a very subtle head nod from her. Uh, wait, crocodile tears? Are crocodile tears when you're actually crying tears and then they're not genuine? Or are crocodile tears where you're crying but then there's no tears coming out? Even two and a half years later, her absence still catches me by surprise. Every time I go to a networking event, I still glance at the door, expecting Helena to walk in, her platinum blonde pixie cut perfectly coiffed, leather cuffs on her wrist, naturally cool with her signature adventures glint in her eye. At her funeral, I saw the house she never spent a single night in, the one she had bought just before coming to New Mexico. Oh. I almost called her after watching Dune Part 2 to see what she thought of it and remember that she died before she was even able to watch Part 1. I wanted to tell her about the amazing experience I had on set a month and a half ago, about how much I had gelled with the director and the producer and was proud of the work I'd done. 
I haven't been able to make, bring myself to make Christmas cookies in the past two years. The thought of not seeing her weighing heavily on me. What's left of the film gels that were in the back of the car that first day we met are now in my living room. The last vestiges of her that I was able to salvage. Her 45th birthday was last week. I saw your coverage of the Apple River verdict. I know you said not to be mean and be civil, but <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> Hi, Joe. How are you doing today? How's it going? Um, where was I? Okay, so crocodile tears means fake tears. You don't care. Faking it. Fake tears, non-genuine tears. Okay. Um, yeah. Ronnie says uh, victim impact statements is for sentencing right now. So the judge is going to make a determination whether to give her max somewhere in the middle, maybe like probation, maybe something less. I went to her grave instead of having dinner and celebrating with her. And while I feel her absence personally, the industry at large feels her loss deeply. I lost one of my best friends, but the industry lost a true visionary. We were robbed of all the images she had the ability to create, all the films she didn't shoot. Her son will grow up without his mother, her family continuing on without her. I know we can never get her back, but what I want is change and justice. I want those that had a hand in her death, either through action or inaction, to face the consequence, consequences of those decisions. This includes Hannah Gutierrez Reed. I ask the court to give her a sentence commensurate and fair to her actions in the role of the death of my dear friend Helena Hutchins. Holding Ms. Gutierrez Reed accountable will reverberate beyond just the sentencing. It reminds everyone in this industry that actions taken to compromise the safety of our workplace, even if unintentionally, have serious consequences. There are people that leave an indelible mark on your soul, an imprint that can never be erased. In the memory of her wit, her kindness, and her unwavering belief in me are permanently etched into mine. She, she always had my back, and I promised her that I would always continue to have hers. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, I'd like to switch to uh, the Google Chance with uh, Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, my name is Anak Rabinal, and I thank the court for this opportunity to speak about the impact of Helena's killing on me. I know I'm supposed to address the court today, but in writing this, it felt more appropriate to address my friend, colleague, creative partner, and playmate, since we never had the chance to say goodbye. Oh, woman, where do I even start? I'm having a flashback to helping you write your AFI application. At least then you were there to talk it out and have a little bicker, as was our typical dynamic. Instead, it's just me alone, staring at a blank page, listening to silence. Why don't we start with the hard stuff first, the stuff that's been pinging around in my head for the last couple of years? They say that death comes in threes. Within the space of a month in the fall of 2021, you were the third death of someone who had been fundamental in shaping my adult understanding of myself in the world. As if you need me to come at you with more Hamlet in the afterlife. But it truly was, when sorrows come, they come not single spies, but in battalions. As I processed the reality of the news that had reached me, there were three thoughts that kept coming up. What a terrible, painful, scary way to die. Over and over again, I kept seeing you in my mind's eyes suffering needlessly, feeling you fight a battle that you were going to lose. But then I kept thinking, what's going to happen to Andros? And then selfishly, how will we ever resolve our reconciliation? That August, when you remembered my birthday out of the blue, it was like maybe it's time to heal the two and a half year rift that had silenced a bond that had, for the majority of its decade long duration, consisted of communicating almost daily. But then that wasn't possible anymore. You were gone. There were so many wonderful things that would never happen again. Indulging you in story time before bed during a shoot so that you could fall asleep on the phone while I drone on so you could dream of our brain baby. Who knew that was a weirdly us state? Because you should see the faces of other DPs when I ask them if they need a nighttime check-in. There will be no more hanging out in your kitchen trying not to eat too many squirrels before going on some kind of adventure. Because who knew what the bathroom situation would be whilst random words, whilst you teach me random words in Russian, and I'd watch you make cracked out Turkish coffee with all orange peel as pre-game fuel. The two of us always plotting how we would get something epic done with very little money, sorting out our next tag team, Thelma and Louise racket. 
Never again would I be your habitual plus one to some crazy inspirational thing where we'd be in full on Lucy and Ethel mode, dead set on meeting the celebrity VIP who was in attendance. And usually we did, because really, who could resist our wonder twin charms? There will be no more fraught existential conversations about what we were doing with our lives and careers or any more big dreams, ideas cooked up together to be kicked down the road for when we'd have the resources and enough clout to do them. You and me, none of our ideas ever liked the small budget. Thank goodness we managed three times with what we had, push out some of our kids into the world. Almost every day, my Facebook memory feed reminds me of some kind of trouble we were up to and some dream we were manifesting into reality. Daily, it reminds me of the two people who are gone, you and the person you inspired and expected me to be, as crazy making as you could be, because let's not gild the lily. Anyone who ever truly got to know you knew how stubborn, determined, and no holds barred you could get when you set your mind to something. And how diplomacy wasn't your way. Yet as crazy making as that could be, you would bring out the best of me. Even if that involved breaking some eggs, so to speak, and you'd bring out the best in every person you engaged with. Recent events have made me come to appreciate how with you, I didn't need a filter or to tone it down or to say it in a nice way. And the gift of being with someone who can accept the light and the dark in you is a rare, rare thing in this world. Even more rare is someone who is courageous enough to show up as authentically as you did. And here's the part that's easy, talking about what I admired in you, your courage and tenacity. I mean, you could spin your wheels in a neurotic frenzy, but when push came to shove, you would dig in, face your fears, and grab hold of your courage. This is her stepfather, Thel. So, I actually wonder if he's going to go out there and speak for Hannah's behalf. The fact that you moved to a foreign country on your own as a young adult to pursue a dream is testament enough to your indomitable spirit, and it didn't stop there. You lived every single moment you had, and you never met a challenge you didn't give your best shot to. I admired your love of beauty and how you sought it out everywhere you looked. Maybe it came from having terrible eyesight when you were a kid, but you looked at the world with wonder and intensity. Your search for different ways of touching and feeling with your eyes and your inability to settle if something wasn't the way it should be was one of the commonalities that held us together and truth be told, the bedrock of trust that got us through the rockier patches because neither of us would let each other be less than our best. I admired your innocence of being. You approached everything with the ingenuity and insouciance of a child and that takes guts in a world that continually tries to turn us into jaded, beaten down cynics. This is a short list of things that I loved and still love about you. With you gone, I find myself worrying about Andros, praying that he will have had enough of you and your vision to treasure the gift that was being born into this life with you as his mother. I still remember the day I visited you, him, and Matt after he was born thinking, shit, he's one brave bitch doing this motherhood thing. While your death is what one might call meaningless, as and it was wholly unnecessary and preventable. I pray that it will echo through time to ensure that its circumstances will not be repeated anywhere else and with anyone else. I pray that it will serve as a rallying point for the systemic change needed in an industry that sees the human beings who put their lives in service of it as dispensable cogs in a machine to serve bottom lines and shareholder expectations. You always fought the good fight and your death will count for something more than the sadness and regret that it's left in its wake. Every one of us whose lives you touched owe you that. When I started writing this, I went to look back for that very first picture of the two of us together so that I could have something with you, something of you with me today. December 25th, 2011. It's funny to think in hindsight that we were the universe's Christmas present to each other. Our friends who introduced us were happy that we were both getting our starts in film and hoped it would be a good connection. Who knew that that Christmas would lead here? If only it had, it had led to what we both dreamt together. Being fabulous older ladies at some glamorous parties after being awarded some big accolades and driving everyone around us crazy because we'd still be bickering and nitpicking on how we could have made the film better. I miss you, my friend. I'm sorry we won't be able to say the things that needed to be said, the apologies that needed to be exchanged. It's painful to know that we won't grow old together. All I know, all I can do now is promise you that I'll do my best to live up to being the person and artist you knew and wanted me to be and to do my utmost to uphold your legacy. And now I thank the court for permitting me this time to the share to impact of holiness death on me and to ask it to do what it should to bring justice to the situation. Thank you. Thank you.
uh, Olia, of bonding over our shared passion for film, bringing support during our toughest moments as immigrants and young filmmakers. As a mother, a talented cinematographer, and a successful woman, Helena juggled numerous responsibilities. Yevke always made time for her friends. Our daily hikes were not just about exercise. They were moments of solace and connection, where Helena's words of encouragement lifted my spirits without fail. Together as female filmmakers, we confronted the obstacles of our industry, finding strength in each other's company. Helena poured her heart- Right, was that her? I was like, wait a second, she looks familiar. Uh, the lady in the crowd. Heart ...into every project, infusing it, infusing it with generosity and kindness that left a lasting impact on everyone she worked with. Her presence on set was a beacon of light, spreading joy wherever she went. She often overlooked her own needs, prioritizing others above herself. When Helena passed away, I was consumed by grief, feeling the loss of not only my closest friend, but also my greatest source of inspiration. She represented hope for a brighter future in the film industry, where creativity and kindness could thrive. Losing her meant losing a part of myself and a cherished creative collaborator. Though she may no longer be with us, Helena's legacy lives on in the hearts of all who knew her. We are committed to honoring her memory by continuing to champion the values she held dear, ensuring that her impact on the world will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. To put into words the devastation that I felt and will forever feel from the loss of my friend, Helena Hutchins, because mere words could never hold all of who she was or what she meant to me. It is absolutely indescribable, but I will try anyway. Two and a half years have passed and I still look for her. I still expect to see her. I still wonder what adventure she's on and think about checking in. Then my heart drops through my feet. This is a quote by Gloria Allred from October. Alec Baldwin's statements by his attorneys that the family has been, quote, distanced from Helena and quote, for years before he shot and killed her are both shameful and wholly unsubstantiated. So we're confident the court will recognize the tremendous loss of Helena's parents. The sister caused by the killing of Helena on October 21st, 2021. Oh, sorry, this statement was not on October 21st. My bad. Uh, Allred is representing the Hutchins family in suit of loss of... Oh, she's representing Helena's family. Okay. I have to face the reality that I will never see her or hug her or hear her laugh ever again. I will never get to feel that glow that she bathed everyone around her in. And I will never get to be there to celebrate what would have undoubtedly been many, many. Helena was a force. She was complicated and talented and beautiful and caring and kind and funny, and committed and charming and weird and fearless. She was all of my favorite adjectives. She inspired me. And I don't think she knew that because I never got to tell her. She was one of my favorite people in the world. I feel like she has gotten lost in the swarm of all of the finger pointing and blame in the aftermath of this completely preventable tragedy. The only way I have left to honor her is to do everything I can to make sure this never happens again and to try to make sure that the people responsible are held accountable. I've struggled to deal with this repeatedly being called an accident because it was not an accident. It was negligence and nothing else. Every single day there is gunplay on film sets carried out safely by qualified armors. There are countless checks and balances to ensure safety for the cast and crew, and it seems every single one of them was ignored on this production. There were multiple failures by multiple people, that is certain, and the actions of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed were the catalyst for Helena's death. By bringing live ammunition to set, Ms. Gutierrez-Reed set off a chain of events that could only lead to someone being killed, which was ensured by her not properly checking the rounds, by her, not leaving, by her leaving guns and ammunition unattended, by allowing the assistant director to take the gun from her and by allowing her, by allowing Helena to be in the path of that bullet in the first place. Multiple breaches and protocol committed by the defendant made this inevitable and it was only a matter of time. There's one absolute truth here. If Ms. Gutierrez-Reed had properly done her job, Helena would still be alive and Andrus would still have his mother. Your Honor, I beg you to impose the maximum sentence. It will not be and could never be enough of a punishment for the willful negligence committed by the defendant. But she needs to be held accountable for taking Helena's life and for destroying so many others. It doesn't seem to me or anyone that I've spoken to that Ms. Gutierrez-Reed has ever demonstrated even the slightest bit of remorse mm. for her actions. It's so sad. Helena's son, um, Andrews, is so young. I think, um, was he like eight years old when it happened? 
and instead chooses to throw blame at everyone but herself. If prison time is the only way she will face any responsibility for what she has done, it should be for as long as the law allows. Because the ripples of her negligence will never stop being felt by those of us who knew and loved her. Thank you. Thank you. Joel Souza. The other person was on that Metz, Stephen Metz. Oh, okay. Uh, then let's go ahead and do uh, Mr. Metz instead. Is Alec Baldwin going to speak? Mr. Souza, we'll do. We'll, we'll hear from Mr. Souza last. Hello, I'm Stephen Metz, and uh, I just wanted. I did prepare a statement, so I'm just going to read the statement off, and then maybe have a little bit. Uh, the death of Helena Hutchins has had a profound impact on me and my family. I was a very close friend of Helena and her family for many years. Our sons have been best friends since they were four years old. And Helena's husband, Matt, was one of my best friends. Helena and I would like <clears throat> would talk a lot about extreme sports. We spent time biking, riding, rock climbing with our kids. Uh, when she was not out of town working, which was quite a bit. Matt and I would hang out um, and let our kids play. They played together all the time. Uh, during the pandemic, it was really nice because Selena was not working for a good part of it, and we were able to spend a lot of time together. Uh, if you remember, during the pandemic, there were kind of these um, certain families that you could, uh, we, we called them a pod, so you could, um, you know, just, we kind of hung out with like just a very select and a uh, few families and the Hudson's family was one of them. Um, <clears throat> so we would hang out in person. We wouldn't. You know, we didn't wear masks because they were considered, you know, our really close friends. Um, so, uh, in, as far as the impact that that I have seen so far, Matt was devastated when he lost the love of his life. Uh, I know how much he loved Helena. They were married for over 16 years, and they were a wonderful couple. Uh, the loss is devastating to everyone who knew them. Uh, because it turns out, after everything is said and done, we've not only lost Helena, but we have also lost Matt. And we, we uh, basically, Matt has been affected, uh, trapped horribly by this, and he moved away. So um, basically, Matt died uh, when when Helena died, as far as we're concerned. I Meaning, he moved away. He was somebody that I hung out with more than uh, once or twice a week on average. And uh, so in, in Helena's passing and in the negligence that I believe occurred on that set, uh, he didn't only kill or affect Helena, which I know it goes without saying, but it still should be said. You affected many other families and people uh, around uh, Helena. So um, anyway, the loss of Helena has had a ripple effect on our whole community. She was a talented cinematographer and she was loved by everyone who knew her. Her death is a reminder of the fidelity of life and it has left us shaken and sad. Uh, that's an understatement. There's really no, uh, there's no excuse. I mean, you, you have a professional on the set. Now, I don't know all the protocol for, for film. That's not my field, but I do know that you have to take uh, gun safety extremely, you have to be handled uh, with extreme caution in every way. And uh, I really feel that this was due to negligence. So uh, being that there are thousands and thousands of films being made all over the world, uh, this needs to set a precedence. This, this case needs to set a precedence for all of the other, uh, you know, for all the other actors whose lives and, and cinematographers and everyone on the set really, whose lives are at risk with uh, when we have negligence in the in the hands of an armor or supposed armor so um anyway it was a horrible uh, experience for uh, not just the hutchins family but also for our family my son basically lost his really good friend i i, I honestly don't even know if they uh, really talk very much anymore i they start almost every day and play video games together and uh, and it was a tragedy so um, very very sad and that's my that's the end of my statement Thank you. Uh, is the father in court? Yeah, I saw Thel in the back over there. Nicholas Cage was in a movie uh, prior to this. Yes, we can hear you.
Nicholas Cage was a movie that she was an armor of uh, prior to Russ. So I meant to say. Thank you. I would like to thank the court as well as Miss Morrissey and her team for allowing me to speak today. I struggled with what to say here today because what I want is simply not possible. I want that none of this ever happened, that everyone's okay and that lives weren't destroyed. And that, worst of all, his life wasn't lost. Um, I would not presume to speak for Helena, nor for her husband or her son, for her parents or her sister, but I would like to say something on their behalf if I might. Uh, Helena's parents lost their daughter. Her sister lost a sibling and confidant. Matt lost his wife, the other half of himself. And Helena's son lost not only his mother, but everything she had to offer him for the rest of her life. Every kind word, every loving gesture, every support, every influence, every life's lesson, the course of his life has been irrevocably altered. And the world lost not only a person that was a gifted artist, but a truly kind and compassionate person, which often seem to be in short supply these days. As for myself, the last two and a half years are difficult to put into words. Um, what it's done to me and the burdens it's placed on me, both emotionally and physically, are my private bur burdens, and I think I'll choose to keep them that way today. What I will say is that one moment the world made sense, and the next moment it didn't, and it still doesn't, and I don't know if it ever will again. Um, so again, what I really want, I can't have. I want everyone damaged by Miss Reed's failures that day to find peace. So for those of you guys who didn't watch the trial, this is Joel Souza. The bullet went through Helena, and it ended up in him. He was also injured as well, and they extracted the bullet out of him. I want this whole thing not to have been consumed by the world as some sick form of mass entertainment, but I want to still believe in the better angels of our nature. I want the pain to go away. I want to be who I was before this happened, and above all, I want Helena to be back home with her husband and son in the house she never got to live in. Uh, Helena not only had an incredible talent for her art, but she had a talent for life. She was a touchstone for all who knew her, and those of us who were lucky enough to have shared in her fleeting time on this planet are better for it. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, Anya Bay, and that will be read by Alexander James. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anya Bay. I'm the filmmaker and a very close friend of Helena Hutchins. I want to apologize for not being able to attend in person because of my last minute trip overseas but I'm very grateful for the state for reading my statement. I've known Helena since 2014 when I first moved to LA. It was impossible not to connect and fall in love with her instantly as she was that bright beam of light, creativity and energy that could easily ignite the room, if not the entire city. Her passion for cinema was infectious. Her ability to enjoy life and love people around was evident. I felt very privileged to have her by my side, encouraging all of my endeavors. As my family lives far away, Helena became one of a few people that, firm, that formed my family circle in Los Angeles. We traveled and celebrated holidays together. We supported each other through thick and thin, and of course, we created beautiful films together. We were working side by side, Helena as a director of photography, and I was a writer slash producer. We collaborated on multiple amazing projects, including our very first feature film, which was almost impossible to make. But not for Helena. She didn't believe in impossible. She was a fearless leader with a unique creative vision and deep appreciation for her crew. And I know that hundreds of people can back me up on that. She was a true inspiration. We had many more plans to realize and dreams to fulfill together. And it still doesn't sit with me that it's never going to happen. Helena was a very loving mother and wife, daughter and sister, friend and cinematographer. She was a cinematographer with the capital C, perhaps the most dedicated filmmaker I know. This is her stepfather here. Who would always go an extra mile, if not a hundred miles, only to take the best shot regardless of how hard it was. 
Just when finally, after all these years of hard work, she started to get recognized in Hollywood, which we all know could be very cruel and heartbreaking. This horrible turn of events during the production of Rust should have never happened. Set safety should never be overlooked, or as in this case, completely and utterly disregarded, especially when it comes to weapons. I want to end with this. The tragic death of the incredible Helena Hutchins is not just a huge loss for her family, friends, and people that knew and loved her so much. It's a loss for the entire film community. She deserved better. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. He was very stylish. Uh, Gloria Allred will address the court on behalf of Helena's mother, father, and sister. Gloria also looking stylish. I'm doing good, WWE. How are you? Did you watch WrestleMania a week ago? Maybe she's having a hard time. No, the jailhouse call. She said that <laughs> it's not a big deal. She doesn't mind eating cat food. She doesn't mind sleeping on the bed. Or, uh, we'll go over the jailhouse calls together. <laughs> I don't know. Seems like she's doing okay in there. Or maybe she's just lying. All right, they are setting her up right now. Um, so we have a summary of the jailhouse calls. We don't have the actual jailhouse calls, but maybe they will release them. Hannah says jail is a forced vacation, that she's doing fine, that she has to, that if she has to spend more time in jail, it will be okay. Where's the one about the cat food? Hannah Gloria calls Carrie a bitch. <laughs> Attorney Gloria Allred, Allred, Morocco, and Goldberg. Uh, and also, uh, on behalf of my co-counsel, John Carpenter, Carpenter and Zuckerman, um, I would like to read a statement by Helena's mother, and then we have a video of her mother, whose name is Olga Solovey, and she will be speaking in uh, Ukrainian, Russian, but we have English subtitles uh, for uh, Olga's statement. After that, I would like to read a very brief statement by uh, the sister of Helena, Svetlana Zemko, who will also speak in Ukrainian, Russian, but we have English subtitles for her video. And finally, I, do, I would uh, appreciate the indulgence of the court to read a short statement of uh, Helena's father. We have no video for him due to his health. Uh, his name is Anatoly Androsevich. Uh, and then I will conclude, I have some photos as well of uh, the parents and sister with Helena. So thank you very much for your courtesy in this matter. Uh, this is a statement of Olga Solovey, Helena Hutchins' mother. Good afternoon. My name is Olga and I am the mother of Helena. It is extremely difficult for me to speak about this. Helena was the best daughter on this earth. I remember how she graduated with the most excellent marks from two universities here in Ukraine. Even so, she left for the USA to study and pursue her dreams. She had a beautiful family, her son Andros. She loved him madly and endlessly. All of her friends absolutely adored her. After this tragedy, my life has been split into two, before and after. Time does not heal. It simply prolongs my pain and suffering. I have hope that the guilty, those that are responsible for the death of my daughter, will be punished fairly and sentenced justly. Justice must prevail. And I would like to say also 
that Olga and Svetlana made these videos despite the fact that where they live in Ukraine, in Kyiv, they are being bombed every single day. This is the video of Olga. Хаченко мене звуть Ольга. Сьогодні я хотіла б вам розказати про свою доньку, яка була дуже талановита, гарна, дуже гарно вчилась, дуже добре до нас ставилась. Я пам'ятаю той день, коли її не вбрали. Мені дуже тяжко. Дуже тяжко без неї. Я не можу. в університеті, потім вона родила гарного хлопчика, мого внука, з яким я зараз не маю можливості бачити. Вона була дуже гарною матір'ю, але більше всього вона працювати любила. Це моє життя. Дуже, дуже, дуже тяжко дивитися, як дитина росте без матері. Я хотіла б ще сказати, що вона вчилася в школі дуже гарно, невідмінно. Вже закінчила. Всі вузи, в яких вона навчалася, я від усіх, від усіх чула тільки гарні слова. І сьогодні мені не проходить ця біль втрати. Вела до них кожен рік. Я бачила, як Андрос підростає. Як він на неї дуже схожий. Оля дуже нас всіх любила. Вона завжди говорила, мама, я хочу, щоб ви жили краще. Весь час вона мене прилишала до себе. Вона oh, wait, хотіла, sorry, щоб I... я була поруч. Do you guys want me to read it? I forgot some people listen to this without watching the screen. I, I don't know. If you want me to read it, just let me know. Светлана <laughs> У Галі дуже було багато друзів, які завжди приходили до нас, з яким вона старалась підтримувати контакти. Вона всім дзвонила. Ми з нею дзвонювалися кожну неділю. Ми були на телефоні кожен рік. Це було завжди на сьогодні або сьогодні. Ми завжди спілкувалися годинами. Ми комунікували за годинами. Кращого друга, ніж Галя, в мене не було. Я не мала більше друга, ніж Галя. Вона буде все з мене. Вона поділитися зі мною усім. В неї дуже гарна сім'я була. Вона була добра сім'я. Але цей день перевернув все життя. Як цей день перевернув все життя? 
мені дуже важко без неї. Extremely difficult without her. Я ще чекаю, коли я неї зустрінусь. Every minute I wait until I meet her again. Але я дала собі слово, що я обов'язково побачу, що виросте, коли він буде навчатися, коли він жениться, коли в нього буде. Sorry. However, I gave myself my word that I will see Andrews growing up, getting out of education, get married, make his own family, and I have to hang on. She says I can't. When Helena died, it was 3 o'clock in the morning for us, and I couldn't fall asleep that night. I couldn't fall asleep because I was anxious inside. At 3 a.m., I saw Matt was calling. I was really scared because I knew something had to have happened. Because they never called during the night. For a long time, he couldn't verbalize what happened. He only said, Mama, something horrible has happened. For five minutes, he couldn't tell me what happened. Finally, I broke and said, what happened? He said, Helena's no more. After that moment, I can't remember anything. I was home alone. Aww. I was screaming, completing with him. Maybe this isn't the end. Maybe something will be, something will get better. But he told me she is gone. It's the hardest thing to lose a child. There's no words to describe and time does not heal. It's two and a half years past and it gets worse and worse. The first year, I was still fooling myself into the hope that maybe she will still come to me. For the second year, I was trying to come to terms with what really happened, that maybe I'm too weak. But Helena would always say, Mom, you're so strong. But it doesn't work for me. I cannot be strong. I want to say that it will not get easier for me if someone will get punished and how many years the terms will carry. It's irrelevant to my pain. However, it's important to me that there is justice and that it prevails and those that are guilty will be punished for the crimes that they committed. I wanted to, oh, I can't see. I wanted it for somebody to come up to me, express their condolences, simply look into my eyes, and I wanted to look in those people's eyes. Um, I'm not quite sure what that says. It's under long crime. That would make me feel a little bit better, but nobody, what? Nobody ever came? Wait, what? Oh, is she talking about like um, Alec Baldwin, Hannah Reed? Like none of them reached out to the mom to express her condolences? Nobody ever came, she says. <laughs> I was at the funerals coming to this last year, but no one came but Helena's friends. But 
кроме Галіних друзів, нікого не бачила. І боляче. It hurts that people that are at fault have never tried to come to her mother. Люди, які винуваті, вони навіть не підійшли до матері. Я не можу зрозуміти. I cannot fathom. Everyone who is connected to Helena's death. До смерті Галі. Ніхто до мене не підходив, ніхто не вибачався, ніхто не співчував. No one has expressed any sympathy. Вона дуже багато працювала. She was such a hard-working girl. She had her every hour on the schedule. She loved her son. Their relationship so close, she couldn't have enough of him. Вона просто не могла надихатися їм. She called him every single day. Вона дзвонила йому кожен день. Which she would tell me. Вона розказувала йому казки. She would tell him stories. Вона розповідала про роботу. About her work and she was telling him good night. Each and every night it was every day. Він відпочивав, це було кожен день. Не було такого дня, щоб вона не дзвонила йому. These... There was not a single day that she would call him when she was away from L.A. She would always laugh, be joyful and happy. And I was elated in the thought that everything was going her way and worse working out for her. I believe she was happy in her family life. She wanted a baby girl. Вона ще дуже хотіла дівчинку. Перший місяць я була там цілий місяць. Я попросила її кремірувати її в Мехіко. Але я попросила, я хотіла попрощатися. Я привезла в Лос-Анджелес. They brought her body to Los Angeles. I said goodbye, and we picked her remains after two weeks. The funeral was at the Hollywood Forever, which is the center of the city, a beautiful place where films were shot. There's a big stage of a bunch of people gathered there. They show films there. And she is next to her craft. She is next to a lake with swans. An amazing place. is one of the most courageous women I have ever met in addition to living in the war zone and suffering the tragedy of her daughter. She is a nurse who cares for those who have been wounded in the war. Next is uh, Svetlana Zemko, Helena's sister. And, Helena, and Svetlana says this, as I gathered my thoughts to write this statement, I wanted to start by emphasizing an important memory. When my mother and I were building our homes in Kyiv, one of the most fundamental things we were dreaming of was how our entire family would gather together comfortably at this home with Helena. As it stands now, that will never happen again. I very much wanted for Helena to meet my children and my husband. Helena will never meet my baby boy who was born after her death. Her death has shattered my heart. She was not simply my sister. She was my friend. And in a certain sense, 
my second mother. The video of Svetlana. Bye, Jill. Have a good one. Let me slow this down. She was forming a sense like my mama, and she helped me raise. Oh, she helped raise my childhood. We had a lot of very warm, kind of heartfelt stories and moments. When I was little, we would have these funny little competitions, fooling around, and with the years that passed and we become older. Our age differences felt less and less noticeable. And from the motherly role, she took the role of my closest best friend, our closest friend. Hey, Virtus, that's Gloria already, yeah. We would have fun, hang out, go shopping together. She would make me feel like her equal. And I felt myself so grown around her. She would take me everywhere with her. The time that was fun together was so interesting for me. Even if it was just for a walk, she would dress up in her coolest clothes. She had such a good fashion sense. She had great taste. It was touching that she would share everything with me. She showed me what kindness and generosity looked like. She would never keep anything just for herself. She would even share with me the last piece of chocolate. She never took anything bigger or better for herself. She would always share it between us sisters. I was bragging to everyone about my sister. I would even joke and say how lazy I am. And how she was hard, how hard working she was. She worked for the two of us. She was really working so hard to get her dream accomplished. My sister was so cool. She was my friend. In a sense, my inspiration and role model. The times when I felt low, I would recall, I would recall my sister who was always determined and strong. She was undeterred by any problems and would always go to reach, to reach her goal. She would inspire other people as well, and she would always lift me up. She was a person who was the shining light around. As I sit here today, I realistically cannot name one bad quality that she possessed. Just truly none of them, not because she's my sister, because she was a person that was so amazing. Uh, Gloria, is Gloria Allred is representing uh, the Hutchins family, not Alec Baldwin. She was truly an example for me to follow and respect my upbringing. She, in some aspects, gave me more than my mom did. Uh, with our children, at least once a year or two, we would gather all together around a big table. Like the whole family, maybe for Christmas time or some other holiday. That was my dream for the kids to all play together, for us to gather this big table with a crackling fireplace. It will be surrounded, but the warmth of our love, and I understand now it will never happen. Oh. I cannot, I just have to run away from it. Didn't want to cry. It is one thing to talk about how great she was, but another to understand that she is gone forever. I was trying to hold on to my emotions as best as I could, but I cannot. 
міцніше по вулиці трапилося, бо я розуміла, що якщо я ще буду плакати, то I cannot allow myself to cry because if I cry, I cannot imagine what will happen to my mom. I do not want the situation to be taken as an unpunished accident, like it just happened and it's gone. It is thrown in the wind. People should carry responsibilities for the things that they have done and for the effect that it has on others. A good guy. I don't think it's a guilt of one person only. I think it's a collective guilt and the responsibility for what has happened to her. And that it's for the court to decide what everyone who is legally responsible for her death as evidence will show. Each should take responsibility for their part, for their participation in it. What happened is not only that the life of one person that was taken, it's the psychological and physical health of an entire family. I feel so bad for her son. The statement of Anatoly Androsevich, father of Helena Hutchins. Oh, she named her son after her father. Demise of my daughter, Helena on the 21st of October 2021 became the tragedy and biggest bitter loss of my life, as well as the lives of my close loved ones. There is no way I can put into words to express the soul-crushing pain and suffering that I live through every day. The constant state of stress, the turmoil of my soul, have drained my physical strength and caused an abrupt decline of my health with continued physical pain in my heart. Every day I remember Helena. I remember the moments of our lives. Since she was a child, my Helena was a very curious and adventurous, hardworking, friendly, and caring person. At 11 years old, Helena convinced me to show her the nuclear submarine. We walked through each part of the nuclear submarine. As she grew up, it was her dream to make a documentary film about nuclear submarines with an emphasis on the threat of nuclear weapons for humanity. My Helena had a devoted- Does this guy not realize he's like on camera? <laughs> he's like fidgeting so much. He's like distracting me. I'm like trying to just like pay attention and listen. Oh my God. He's doing everything. To make a documentary film about nuclear submarines with an emphasis on the threat of nuclear weapons for humanity. My Helena had a devoted and loving husband, Matthew, a wonderful son, Andros, and a profession she loved in the most developed and democratic country, the USA. I could not have ever fathomed that her life would be endangered while she was at work. As a former Marine officer, I fully understand the responsible and correct way to handle firearms. I am confidently stating that the death of my daughter was caused by systematic gross violations of safety rules and regulations during filming of the movie Rust. I do not wish for revenge, but believe that each person responsible for the death of my Helena needs to carry the punishment that is equal to their guilt. For me, it's, it was a nail biting, the nail biting thing. Oh. Maybe, well. just maybe, this might prevent the same type of tragedies in the future to others and spare other parents from such a heart-wrenching catastrophe. And now I would like to show the court very quickly just some photos. There is a photo of Olga and Helena and Andros. Hannah's brother? Um, I don't know. I saw him. He was there during trial, too. I thought it was like a news reporter or something. <laughs> I'm not too sure who. It looks like it's not buttoned right. <laughs> I think it's just sagging right here. Next photo is a photo of Svetlana and Helena.
On the last photo, Your Honor, is Anatoly this and his grandson, Andros. Oh, I thought she said she was reading something from Andros, and that was when she was talking about um, Helena's father. Sorry, was I confused? I, I was probably confused. My bad. And I, as was mentioned, this week, April 9th, was, would have been Helena's 45th birthday in honor of her birthday. Wait, I thought she was way younger. Uh, our law firms have placed flowers on her grave at Hollywood forever. May she rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Your Honor, we just have a brief uh, five minute slideshow and that will, con that will conclude the state's presentation. Hey David, how are you doing today? I don't think she's eked out a tear at all. I don't know, maybe she wiped away and we didn't see it. The sentiment that I'm getting is that she doesn't think she's responsible. It's other people's fault. Everyone's lying. Everyone's against her. It did. <laughs> Come here. Why won't this go into... Yeah, I feel like to her, she's like, eh, 18 months, it's nothing. I'll serve my 18, I'll be out. Now, she does have another pending case uh, with firearms as well. Hi, Shiro. Are you dreaming right now? I think Shiro's dreaming right now. He's dancing. Shiro. Shiro. Are you having a good dream? I can't tell if you're having a nightmare or a good dream. <laughs> What's the pending case? Uh, bring a firearm into a bar. I'm sure she'll get time served. I feel like it's usually pretty common. Have they ever denied someone time okay. served? Um, we're going to have to do this a different way. Why don't we... Let me see what the best way is to handle this. Like that. May I approach? Mm -hmm. This is the other one. This was filed about half a year ago. Maybe they, did they go through her phone and that's where they found the evidence? Criminal charges detail. Unlawful carrying of a firearm in a licensed liquor establishment. Charge date, October 1st, 2021. Oh, that was like a couple weeks before. Um, wait, was that after? No, wait, was that afterwards? Hold on a second. Before, okay. This was a couple weeks before um, the shooting on Rust. So we have 710 docket call, July. That's like in a couple months from now. Um, August 6th, jury selection hearing slash Valdir. Like, I, I don't know. Are they really going to pursue this? We'll see. Did her husband say something? Did I miss it? Uh, so far, we heard from uh, Helena's agent, friends, best friend. Uh, Joel Souza was on there. There was another guy. And then her family members. Um, some of her family members in Ukraine. Sister, mom, well, dad. Right here so you can see it. And I think that will work for that camera. And don't forget when, you're, when you get your cue, okay? Um, space bar, we'll start the music, let's mic it, and then arrow key, we'll take you from slide to slide, okay? Yeah, there was like a social media post that she did or something about hiding a gun in her butt cheeks or something. 
<laughs> it sounds like I'm making this up, but I'm not making it up. <laughs> when I was reading the articles about Hannah yesterday, uh, I was like, oh, some of, art some of these articles must be like bullshit. There's no way. And then I found the state's filing and I was like, oh, okay, it has to be legit. Yikes. Oh, I'm so used to her with like the bleach blonde hair. copyright oh i don't know maybe i'll mute it i might have to mute it then oh you're right sorry yeah yeah i feel like slideshows are always so hard to watch um whenever i watch a slideshow of steve oh my god it's like just like fallen i feel so bad for her family no she didn't say vagine i think she was referencing her her butt cheeks or something like that uh, this is like, yeah, the look. With her bleach blonde. You don't like slideshows? What do you have against slideshows? Yeah, if there's copyright music, uh, YouTube will like shut down the stream for like a little bit. Mm, I cry ugly during funeral side shows. Yeah. I think that's her with her mom. So when the shooting happened, she was in her early 40s. Wait, can we go back to the slideshow? Why are we looking at the judge? What happened to all the emotions? It's like, she's like, you know what? I, I can't keep it up for more than an hour. It's too long. <laughs> Okay, they're not showing us a slideshow. Why not? It's still going. Right? Yeah, it's still going. Okay. Listen, we all know that Hannah doesn't care. I, I don't want to look at her. <laughs> Go back to the slideshow. I'm just saying, there, there's a huge difference between. Because initially when, uh, when people were speaking, she was getting very emotional. And I was like, oh, maybe she's changed. You know, maybe she really does feel bad. It's like, now we have the jailhouse calls. And then now she's just back to like, this is her trial phase. <laughs> she's back to the trial phase. 
still did i notice her dad was sitting on the state side and not on her side um i don't know if that's just like the way the seatings are arranged or if he was just like sitting there but it is reverse isn't it during the trial hannah was on the other side so maybe the dad assumed that she was going to continue being on that side Uh, it's my understanding that dad fully supports her. They made a GoFundMe for her and GoFundMe shut it down. Oh boy, here we go. <clears throat> First and foremost, my heart aches for the Hutchins family and friends and colleagues as well. And it has since the day this tragedy occurred. Elena has been and always will be an inspiration to me. I understand she was taken too soon, and I pray that you all find peace. I am beyond grateful that Joel survived that terrible day. My heart goes out to the film industry for the devastating pain that this tragedy caused and the old wounds that have been reopened. I am saddened by the way the media sensationalized our traumatic tragedy and portrayed me as a complete monster, which has actually been the total opposite of what's been in my heart. I mean, they got Joe House calls, Hannah, but okay. Your Honor, when I took on Rust, I was young and I was naive, but I took my job as seriously as I knew how to. Despite not having proper time, resources, and staffing, when things got tough, I just did my best to handle it. Today, I humbly ask you to consider probation, a probation where I can contribute to society through community service, and I can continue my counseling, and I welcome any classes that you may deem necessary for me to attend. I give you my word now that I would strictly follow the rules and respect the parameters of that probation. I beg you, please don't give me more time. The jury has found me in part at fault for this god awful tragedy, but that makes me a monster. That makes me human. Thank you. Thank you. Then I believe Bill Reed would like to speak to the court this time. Hi, Wayne. Yeah, still doesn't bear responsibility. Just like I was young. Thank you, Your Honor. Brief state, but uh, it's a horrible tragedy for that wonderful lady. Lady to lose her life. Also, be a tragedy to put my daughter Hannah in the penitentiary for that. It's alleged she brought, uh, introduced live ammunition on the set. That's not true. Why would she? The two people because she was incompetent. That's why she brought the live ammunition on the set. She was incompetent and she didn't know. And that's the reason why she didn't check on set because she just assumed there's just none, no live ones at all. Oh my god. <laughs> live ammunition on the set. That's not true. Why would she? The two people responsible for whatever come on the set are the vendor and the property master who had to work for her. On that terrible day, they had Hannah off the set doing prop duties. And she asked him to please bring her back on when Mr. Bowman comes so he could do a fight. It's not a good look to be arguing the facts of the case when the jury has already found the facts of this case. You know what I'm saying? Like, for him to argue the facts right now to the judge, like, it's just not a good look. I don't check on the gun. I wonder if um, Hannah wrote the, wrote the speech and was like, here, Dad, read this to me, okay? Read this for me. <laughs> please bring her back on when Mr. Bowman comes so he could do a final check on the gun. And it's instructed off the set, would you? Huh. The two people responsible for whatever come on the set are the vendor and the property master who had to work for her. On that terrible day, they had Hannah off the set doing prop duties. And she asked him to please bring her back on when Mr. Bowman comes so he could do a final check on the gun. And it's instructions. They, they, they did not do that. If they had it, this horrible day would not have it. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies. She shouldn't have left the gun also, though. Why would you leave the gun? Why not just stay with the gun? The gentleman in the court. Thank you. Oh, God, that was horrible. Oh, Mr. Thelreed. Thank you, Your Honor. 
And, and just briefly, Judge, I've, I've made most of my arguments in the written pleadings. And Judge, it's uh, nobody in this courtroom could not be moved by what we just saw. The family, um, Helena's family, her friends, uh, it was a horrible tragedy. Um, there's no doubt about that. And it's a tragedy for everybody. I'm sorry, the, I don't think your client was moved. There were a uh, number of lives changed, lost. Um, Bethe, her friends talked about that. And that includes Ms. Gutierrez. I, I just want the court to know primarily <clears throat> that she has felt remorse. And maybe I've talked to her as much as, as anybody, at least on the legal side, Ms. She's broken down. She's had mental breakdowns. She said, if only, many, many, many times. And she's, it hasn't come out. It hasn't come out until today because of the legal proceedings and the system we have. I'm sorry, but we saw her demeanor on, when the police interrogated her, we saw her demeanor just like sitting there. She came back for interrogation about three weeks after the shooting happened. And we saw her demeanor on there too. She was just talking very casually, blase. <laughs> have but she has truly felt remorse and i will tell the court that as an officer of the court that she has indicated that to me and then when she found out that helena um died at the hospital what did she do she gave the bag of alleged cocaine slash protein powder to a co-worker that wasn't even close to her because she was afraid of getting in trouble further this court has seen jail calls she's made i i would submit to this court that you could probably survey 100 people after something like this happens, uh, including everybody that participated in the trial, uh -huh. scrutinize all of our calls uh -huh. and pick out something bad that one of us said. Because, Your Honor, none of us are what we are on our best day, uh -huh. nor are we what we are on our worst day. And as Ms. Gutierrez said, she, she's human. She's flawed, just like everybody else in this courtroom. Uh -huh. We, this court, to consider um, fairness uh, in respect that this was a cascade of tragedy, uh, as some of the speakers indicated. Uh, there were multiple system failures uh, by multiple people. Some of those people have come before the court, as this court knows, and, and received uh, six-month misdemeanor probation. Uh, some have not been punished. Some have yet to come before the court. Um, at least one individual is going to be tried in July. And so uh, I know this court has the responsibility to weigh all of that and to determine what is commensurate and fair, as one speaker said, for Ms. Gutierrez. And what, what does that mean in the scope of things and what, what has come before this court? And I'm asking the court to consider that. And also what probation might do for her in terms of rehabilitation, which is another goal of our system, Your Honor. Anything else? No, Your Honor. You see, I would have sympathy. It was just like one really bad mistake that was fucked and it resulted in the shooting. But it was like over and over. Like the state did a really good job at showing that she didn't do a good job at her own job, that she just took it kind of like, like a super chill way. They did a really good job at showing that. It wasn't just like, oh, she was very thorough at her job and then she like completely just truly just like fucked up or something. All right, so I've made some notes along the way. So if I refer to the notes and I'm not looking at tables, it's because I'm reading. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentations. Thank um, the friends and family of Helena uh, for presenting uh, their memories and their losses of Helena. There are really three choices for sentencing before me. Um, what the defense wants is a conditional discharge. This means straight probation, unless Ms. Re Ms. Gutierrez comes back on a probation violation. <laughs> she said misery. <laughs> she won't have a felony conviction on her record so she can continue to possess firearms. No. Again, unless she comes back on a probation violation and receives the imposition of the probated sentence. The second one has not been offered by counsel, but uh, I've certainly thought of it, and it's uh, to continue her in the Santa Fe County Detention Center. That would be for 12 months. That's all she's allowed to stay at the detention center. And then put her on probation for the rest of the time. She's facing 18 months. She's got pre-sentence confinement for about a month or so. Wait, what? That's it? She's at one, she's at a detention center. What? That's it? 12 months detention center, and then the rest? <laughs> um, in, in this scenario, she won't experience prison. She will be a convicted felon. She cannot carry a firearm under federal law and for a specific time under New Mexico law. Oh, this is scenario two. Okay. And then there's prison, and uh, the state has proposed at 85% of the time uh, sentenced to incarceration based on the uh, serious violent offense statute. So 85% of 18 months? For all the fanfare and pundits and finger pointing that has been going on for over two years, we were able to seat a jury of her peers who confirmed
they could listen to the evidence received in court and determine the facts and apply the law. They found Ms. Gutierrez guilty of involuntary manslaughter. What were some of the poignant facts that came out during the trial? In her police interview, she proudly owned her position as armorer. Mm -hmm. On October 21st, 2021, chaos ended after the film crew walked off. Ms. Hutchins and others were trying to rate, if you will, how they were going to keep filming. And what was the defendant doing while waiting? She was loading Alec Baldwin's gun. Did she have enough time to load the weapon safely? Plenty. Mm -hmm. Did she load the weapon? Yes. With dummies in a live round. Did she check what she was loading? No. Mm -mm. Why? Well, in her own words, most recently, in her jail calls, she didn't need to be shaking the dummies all the time. <laughs> Yeah, she said that the jailhouse calls. Oh, no. She said the witnesses on the stand lied about it, and she didn't need to be shaking the dummies all the time. Did she check after that? No. And while you've heard her concerns about how she'll never work again as an armorer leading up to the trial, have her concerns changed? No. <laughs> Here's what she says. Oh, no. The this jail whole thing has been a character attack on her. Just recently in her allocution, I'm not a monster. And what does... Oh, where is it? Uh, they talk about how much of Hannah, on the phone, they're talking, she and another, are talking about how much of Hannah's life that, uh, they could take up and that this is messing up her modeling career. <laughs> she did say that. This is while she's incarcerated, waiting for a sentence. And what does she say about the death of Helena? Hannah is dismissive of the judge talking about someone dying mm -hmm. as a result of her actions. Hannah says she's looking at 13 months, which is ridiculous over what happened. Hannah says that people have accidents and people die. It's an unfortunate part of life, but it doesn't mean she should be in jail. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you guys, those jailhouse calls were bad. A conditional discharge is not appropriate. And the second option of leaving you in the detention center would be giving you a pass you do not deserve. I did not hear you take accountability in your allocution. Nope. You said you were sorry. You were sorry, but not... You were sorry for what you did. You were sorry for it and hope they can find peace. It was your attorney that had to tell the court that you were remorseful. Yes, Mr. Bowles was like, shit, my client's speech sucked. Uh, you know what? I'm going to go up there and uh, let me just redo her speech for you, okay? The word remorse, a deep regret coming from a sense of guilt for past wrongs. That's not you. <laughs> You're here by sentences follow stand. I am sentencing you to 18 months of incarceration at a New Mexico women's correctional facility. I find that what you did constitutes a zero, serious violent offense. It was committed in a physically violent manner, a fatal gunshot, done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Ms. Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. Please take her. Get her out of my court. <laughs> I'm going to ask the deputies to watch how the courtroom gets cleared. Please do an order of remand to the transport order to the Department of Corrections and the judgment. Yes, Your Honor. All right. How come she has jelly stains in her mouth? Oh. Oh. I don't know if it was like the lighting or shadowing, or maybe it's like acne or eczema. Or... I don't know. I don't know what it is. Okay, well, we're going to go over the jailhouse calls because they are so bad. They are bad. I was reading them yesterday, and I was like, there's no way. There's no way they're this bad. I thought some of the news outlets were exaggerating, or I don't know. Maybe it was like some one of those like, fake news websites or some shit like that. But uh, we got a hold of the state's response, and she summarizes the jailhouse calls. There has been several news outlets that has requested the state to release the jailhouse calls. So I don't have access to the actual calls yet, but we got like a summary of it. It looks like an allergic reaction. Could be that, too. I don't know. I don't know. Jesus. Um, 18 months in prison. I mean, honestly, 18 months. That's like, that's, I don't know. That's laughable. I'm glad that she got the max, but I'm thinking some of you guys were saying a couple years. Yeah, I, I think she should have faced like max. I don't know. Maybe like three to five years or something. She deserves every minute in prison. I think the state said that, like, um, was it like 85% of the time? So it might be like 85% of 18 months is my understanding. 
Whew. Before she walked out, she looked at the judge. Why you do this? All right, I'm going to use the bathroom really quick, and then let's go over the jailhouse calls. Um, yikes, 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 yikes. Hey, Shibru. Witness the lies. I didn't lie to you on that polygraph, I promise. The cover-ups. I could see his brain on his... The moments they confessed. I grabbed one of the kitchen knives. I Outrageous police interrogations. I know, I forgot the head. I wanted the head. You have to see to believe. Oh my god. Law and crime interrogations. Subscribe today. So uh, the prosecutor said she couldn't that, pretend um, to be remorseful. I think she tried for the first 45 minutes while listening to the victim impact statements. And then it was like, oh, God, I can't do this. I'm going to get wrinkles. This is going to ruin my modeling career. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, what is this? Oh, this is a different case. OK. States. Eighty-five percent is the standard for prison sentences. Listen, give her the full eighteen. Give her the full eighteen. Can I be humbled in prison? I don't know. Maybe. 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 We'll see. Um, I was surprised at how little Reed tried to convince and how poorly. Maybe Reed's just like I just gotta go up there, say my piece really quick, and then just dip out. But they did. Okay, so since the verdict, since the verdict has happened, there's been a lot of things going on. Okay, behind the scenes, a lot of things going on. So Hannah Reed was found guilty uh, about a couple weeks ago, and she was the armorer on the Rust movie set. That's why they found her responsible for this. Uh, this is for, you know, manslaughter. Next is going to be Alec Baldwin. Alec Baldwin's trial is going to happen in a couple of months, I think in June. And why is Alec Baldwin charged? It's because he was the one that discharged the gun. So we'll see what happened with his case. I know he was trying to get his case uh, dismissed, and he's doing a bunch of, like, legal hoops and hurdles because he's like, oh, look, see, the blame is on Hannah. Can't be my fault, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with the trial. Um, I'm sure it's going to happen. Seems like it's going to happen in a couple of months. But since the verdict, her legal team has tried to call for a mistrial. They said that there is something really kind of, like, confusing about the jury instructions and that... It should be a mistrial and Hannah should get a new trial. The judge was like, nah. And then remember, after the verdict was written, her defense team was trying to get her to, you know, be released while she waits for her sentencing. Judge is like, nah, take her away. Now nope, we're locking her up. And then also the defense was like, well, actually, you know, like since we're going to put in an appeal, like, you know, we should not lock her up right now because what if the appeal overturns the decision? And the judge echoes the same thing that she said during the verdict where it was just like, no, the guilty, uh, the jury found her guilty of manslaughter. She's responsible. Someone died. We're taking her. And so not only was all that going behind the scenes, we also got the jailhouse calls, not the actual calls, though. We have a summary of the jailhouse calls. And I think the articles were released last night. So I was on I was on uh, I was like reading a bunch of articles about sentencing, like, oh, what time is the sentencing? Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, jailhouse calls. Are there jailhouse calls of this? <laughs> what happened to jailhouse calls? So we're going to go over the jailhouse calls right now. They are very bad. She goes after the witnesses. She goes after um, Carrie Morrissey, who is the uh, special attorney. I think that's her like official title. The judge, the jury, and a lot of stuff. We also found out that she also has new charges, not not new charges, but charges that were filed um, about half a year ago. And she might have a trial for that one. I don't know. It just seems like it might be a lot of things to, to happen. All right, y'all. Oh, bye. Oh, taxi, thank you so much for the 249. Wishing y'all a nice week. Are you going to go to sleep now? All right. Make sure you watch the VOD, okay? Because um, these uh, jailhouse goals were wild. So I'm going to read this. This is the state's response uh, dated a couple days ago. State's response to defendant's sentencing memorandum and request for conditional discharge. What a word. Comes now the state of New Mexico by and through special prosecutors Carrie T. Morrissey and Jason J. Lewis, who submit the following response to defendant's sentencing memorandum and conditional discharge. One, 
The state opposed the defendant's request for a conditional discharge. While it is true that Ms. Gutierrez is eligible for a conditional discharge, the state asserts that Ms. Gutierrez should not be granted a conditional discharge because upon her arrival in New Mexico, she swiftly committed a host of felonies and has another felony charge pending before Judge Ellington for intentionally hiding a firearm from security at a local bar to get firearm into the bar. Upon successfully circumventing the security at the bar, she went to the restroom, made a selfie video stating, in quotations, they checked my purse, but they didn't check my butt cheeks. Wah, wah. <laughs> I was like going to read that with a straight face. <laughs> I want to know what the judge's face was when she read this, okay? <laughs> Oh boy. At the same time that she was speaking, she held up a nickel plated semi automatic pistol in front of the camera. There is additional evidence that has been previously been presented to the court that Ms. Gutierrez was in possession of cocaine while in New Mexico and while working at the firearms expert on the rust on the set of rust. Yet another felony. <laughs> Number two. The state also opposes a conditional discharge due to Ms. Gutierrez's complete and total... I don't know. That's what I'll say. I was like, maybe she was hiding in her butt cheeks or... <laughs> Listen, like when you go to the bar and they check you, I feel like they usually do one of these checks, right? So they'll pat you down here. They'll go here. Women who are wearing brawls, they'll do like this type of thing. And then the back, I think they just check like maybe like if you have like a belt on, they'll check your purse, but they ain't going to like shove your, their hands in your butt cheeks or any of the cracks or anything like that. Like, it's not that serious. They'll check like the legs, but usually when it comes to like other private parts, like they're not going to be like jamming their fingers up in there. Okay. So if she was hiding a gun in her butt cheeks or if she was hiding it, like, I don't know where her butt was. I, I, I don't know. I, I guess that's how she got through. Also, I don't know. How do you hide a gun in your butt cheeks? That sounds kind of dangerous. <laughs> But maybe she was being hyperbolic. I don't know. Maybe she hit it elsewhere or maybe they just did a bad job of checking. I don't know. It just sounds uh, a little bit hilarious. Number two, the state also opposes a conditional discharge due to Ms. Gutierrez's complete and total failure to accept responsibility for her actions as demonstrated by the summaries below of some of her calls since her incarceration on March 6, 2024. So all these calls happen within a month. Ms. Gutierrez continues to deny responsibility and blame others. She goes so far as to blame the set medic, the paramedics who attempted to save Ms. Hutchins, and even blames the child actor on set for picking up the gun. Moreover, there are references to Ms. Gutierrez being in possession of alcohol during the time the trial was taking place. Wait, what? And continuing to consume alcohol contrary to the release? Wait, what to the condition of her release while on pretrial release with her boyfriend? Who's her boyfriend? Wait, what's her? Maybe that's her boyfriend in the background, sitting in the suit, biting the fingernails. Stunningly, Ms. Gutierrez requested jail. Ms. <laughs> Stunningly, Ms. Gutierrez requested during jail calls that her legal team requests. Oh my God, this is so bad. That Ms. Hutchins' husband and son be contacted and asked to speak on her behalf at her sentencing. I don't know if she's just, I don't know. Like I kept attributing to like, oh, she's just young, immature, doesn't know any better, but she could just be straight up dumb. Like, I'm sorry. She could just be dumb. She continued complaining in her jail calls about the negative effects this incident has had on her life and her modeling career while never expressing genuine remorse at any time. She expressed a willingness to violate further court orders should she be subpoenaed for the Baldwin trial. She referred to the jurors as retards, idiots, and assholes and suggested that her mother could confront undersigned counsel in the restroom <laughs> because counsel uses the same restroom as the public. What is her mom going to do? Is her mom just going to go up to like Morrissey and try to like one up on her or something like that? Like Morrissey looks pretty fucking scary. Okay. She looks scary on the screen. I'm sure she's probably scary in person. Finally, she requested that her employment history be misrepresented to undersigned counsel and the court. So it would appear as though she was working full time prior to the trial. Now, if you guys missed it earlier, we listened to uh, a hearing that took place where Jason Bowles, her defense attorney, was like, oh, you know, Hannah Reed's been working full time. She takes care of her father who has leukemia um, and something else. And then the state responded by saying, well, you know, a week ago we asked for, oh, it was like uh, she was seeing uh, counseling or something like that. She was getting treatment, counseling, blah, blah, blah. And so the state responded and she was like, well, I requested for these, you know, these like job records. I requested the treatment, this, the counseling stuff. 
I still haven't gotten it yet. So I don't know if maybe Hannah told Jason Bowles that she was doing all this, but really she was just bullshitting. And then she didn't expect for them to have to show proof. I don't know. That doesn't really seem to make sense to me. <laughs> Surprisingly, Ms. Gutierrez doesn't seem to mind being in jail and at times appears to genuinely enjoy it. Number three, the state further requests that this court des designate Ms. Gutierrez's offense a serious violent offense pursuant to da 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 da. In quotations, the amount of deductions a prisoner may earn depends on whether the crime for which the prisoner is serving his or her sentence is a serious violent offense or a non-violent offense. A prisoner serving a sentence for a serious violent offense may only receive up to four days per month of deductions, whereas a prisoner serving a sentence for a non-violent offense may receive up to 30 days per month of deductions. 17 crimes enumerated in 14 statutory provisions are by definition set serious violent offenses. We refer to these crimes as per say serious violent offenses another 20 crimes enumerated in 15 statutory provisions or serious violent offenses if the district court finds that the nature of the offense and the resulting harm of the crime under a given set of facts warrants the designation uh, here's a citation right here explaining that a district court must find that the crime was committed in physically violent matter matter either with an intent to do serious harm or with recklessness in the face of knowledge that one's acts are reasonably likely to result in serious harm emphasis added internal quotation marks and citation omitted we refer to these crimes as discretionary serious violent offenses all remaining crimes those not designated serious violent offenses are by definition non-violent offenses the state is requesting the serious violent offense designation due to the extreme recklessness with which Ms. Gutierrez behaved while working as the armor on the set of Rust. It is clear from the digital evidence presented at Ms. Gutierrez's trial that she brought live rounds on set by failing to properly inspect the dummy rounds she provided to the set. Moreover, she failed to check the dummy rounds after providing them to the set and as a result loaded one into the gun holster being worn by Alec Baldwin and the gun belt being worn by Jensen Ackles. She did all of this before she loaded a live round into a prop gun, told the first assistant director that the gun was cold, permitted to be handed off to an actor to manipulate for a scene. Every time a gun was loaded with a dummy round, it was a game of Russian roulette. There is ample evidence that Ms. Gutierrez was using alcohol, marijuana, and cocaine in the evenings during the filming of Russ and may have reported to set to work while under the influence of these substances. It should be noted that on September 3rd, 2021, Mr. Gutierrez, uh, Mr. Oh, Ms. Gutierrez, Ms. Gutierrez's stepfather, Thel Reed, texted her, quotations, did you find the 45 cold ammo? Question mark. And then again, text said, keep looking. This text is from Ms. Gutierrez's stepfather was not used during trial because neither Ms. Gutierrez nor her stepfather testified. This message is a clear indication that Ms. Gutierrez was attempting to obtain a 45 caliber ammunition in the weeks leading up to her work on the set of Russ. Ms. Gutierrez was aware that the guns being used by the actors on the set were real guns and also knew that dummy rounds looked exactly like live rounds. She certainly understood that she was responsible for checking the dummy rounds to ensure that they were inert and understood that people could be killed if a live round was placed into a prop gun. I'm surprised Hannah didn't blame Hutchins for being in the way of the bullet she loaded. If only her father was firing blanks. It's her stepfather. Um, number five, the state requests that Ms. Gutierrez be sentenced to 18 months in the Department of Corrections with a designation of serious violent offender due to her recklessness in the face of knowledge that her acts are reasonably likely to result in serious harm. A standard set forth under New Mexico law. Should the court determine that a suspended slash deferred sentence is appropriate, the state requests the court exercise its full probationary discretion and sentence Ms. Gutierrez to five years of probation as a condition of any suspended slash deferred sentence. So here are the summaries of jailhouse calls. How many pages we got? Oh God, this is like more than, <laughs> it's like more than half. All right, summary of jailhouse calls. Um, is there a way for me to indicate what the date would be on these? I don't have the dates. I was trying to figure out based on like the file name. However, um, we all know that she was taken away in beginning of March. So these jailhouse calls happened like about a month ago and afterwards. Hannah says the other girls in jail were saying that, I can't believe they threw your pretty little white ass in here for nothing, Hannah says. Like, yeah, girl, for real. She says that so far she's built for jail and likes tap water. She likes hard beds and the cat food isn't too bad every day. 
The male says that when Hannah was taken away, that mom said, this is some bullshit. Hannah laughs loudly. He tells her what mom did, and Hannah says that she was glad her mom stood up and said something. Hannah laughs. Oh, so after Hannah was taken away, um, the courtroom was muted. And then someone in my chat was like, oh, Hannah's mom said something. And I was like, oh, I missed it. And we couldn't hear it. So now we know that the mom stood up and said, this is bullshit. Hmm. Hannah laughs about all of this. The male says he's has he's been to jail before. She says she didn't think she would like it, but now she does. Oh, great. Now you have 18 months of it. Have fun. Have fun. Well, I guess prison is going to be a lot different than jail. Here's another phone call. Hannah says that she can't believe the judge put her in jail. Hannah talks about the jury and how they only took two fucking hours and how she got the book thrown at her. She says that everyone lied on the stand except for two or three experts. She talks about the witnesses and how they all lied. She says that she didn't need to be shaking the dummies all the time. And that's what the judge was referring to during the sentencing. She complains about what happened on set and says people are still going to die on set. She complains about Gabby Pickle. She complains about the jury and how people who got immunity and had pending lawsuits. Oh, yeah, yeah. She complains about what happened on the set and says people are still going to die on set. There are ways to prevent people from dying, and that's what your job entailed, Hannah. Hello. Hello, Kylie. How are you doing today? How's it going? She says she wishes TMZ would shut up and that literally she is fine. She complains about the Washington Post and how if they talk to any worker in there, they would all say she is happy and bubbly another call she talks about being a felon and how it's going to work with and how it's going to work with all of his guns and how she isn't sure how it will work what the fuck is that sentence she talks about being a felon and how it's going to work with all of his guns and how she isn't sure how it will work i'm confused she says that he can put them in a safe and he can tell them that she doesn't know the combo Oh, okay. So I think this is her and her boyfriend. So if Hannah becomes a felon, how is it going to work with her boyfriend having possession of guns? And I guess maybe this is the boyfriend said that, oh, you know, I could just put it in a safe and say you don't have access to the combination. Okay. I'm assuming that's a conversation with her boyfriend, maybe. Uh, different phone call. She talks about how she is wrongly incarcerated. After Hannah was taken to custody... After Hannah was taken to custody, Hayden, the other party to the call, goes to her hotel room to clean up. And Sean says, where did this bottle of Crown Royale come from? Hayden claims it and says Sean wasn't thrilled. Here's another call. Hannah talks about playing games with the other inmates. Hannah says she is fine in there. Hannah talks about suing various media outlets. Hannah goes back to TMZ and how she's built for jail. Hannah says that if she's subpoenaed by Baldwin's trial, she would not show up. Mom says that she was held in jail for three weeks for contempt. Oh my God, wait, what? <laughs> they locked up her mom for three weeks for that? Wait, what? Three weeks? I'm actually really surprised it was three weeks. Hannah complains that she shouldn't be subpoenaed if Baldwin didn't show up for... Wait, hold on a second. Why is this sentence like mixed up like this? Hannah says if she is subpoenaed to Baldwin's trial, she will not show up. Mom says that she was held in jail for three weeks for contempt. Hannah complains that she shouldn't be subpoenaed if Baldwin didn't show up for her. Another call. The judge giving her time for no reason. The judge isn't fair and they are going to Supreme Court. Another call. Hannah doesn't understand why the judge locked her up when she was on terms of release. Hannah says she was trying to get Carmela, Jason Bowles legal, to talk to the family of Helena about coming to sentencing to speak on her behalf. I don't know if she's just... Maybe she's just like a really clueless person. Here's another phone call. Hannah talks about the friend she's making and how she is having fun. She says she doesn't want to go to prison for 13 months, but, you know, it is what it is. Hannah's saying she's having more fun in jail than he, the other party to the call, did. Another phone call. Hannah says jail isn't like summer camp, but it is kind of like summer camp. Another call. Hannah says that everything is going to get reviewed and she feels like people were paid off to look the other way. Hannah goes into some sort of conspiracy theory about how she was used as a pawn. Hannah says it's not too bad in jail. Another call. Hannah complains about what was allowed at trial. She wasn't allowed. Which, wait, sorry. What was allowed at trial, what wasn't allowed. Hannah says the judge is terrible. And Carrie got together with the judge and they were against her. Hannah complains about how fast the jury deliberated. Hannah says that, wait, okay. So Rain made this really important, um, she brought this up. She was saying how Hannah was complaining about how the jury took two hours to deliberate, blah, 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 blah. But then 
But then how long did it take for Hannah to check those guns, you know, for like the live ammunition? How long did it take for her to check the dummies and stuff like that? <laughs> um hannah says that everyone that testified was giving an immunity had a lawsuit pending or was part of the problem yes i believe they were part of the problem but were they like the problem that hannah was no hannah was the problem she calls the jury retarded when they say a jury of your peers they mean fucking retards that's what hannah says another call hannah wait hold on a second isn't she technically calling herself a fucking retard then because she says a jury of your peers that would mean to reflect what, who she is I don't know. I'm just lying. Um, Hannah calls Carrie a bitch and she's doing it out of spite. Hannah thinks the judge is getting paid off and thinks she deserves credit for being respectful. She's mad because she isn't going to get bail. <laughs> Hi, Taxi. How are you doing? Taxi, I thought you were heading out. Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Um, Hannah calls Carrie a bitch and she's doing it out of spite. Hannah thinks the judge is getting paid off and thinks she deserves credit for being respectful. She's mad because she isn't going to get bail. Oh, I read that already. Um, another call. She says there's a lot of nice things about jail and that is a forced break from life. She says that she paid a guy named Roger $3,000 to be her PR person. She said that Jason Bowles needs to talk to Roger to get everything out. Hannah and her mother joke about her mom getting thrown out of court and that judge is a menace. Hannah thanks her mom for the outburst. Hannah was thinking that mom is going to be behind her getting booked into jail. Here's another call. Hannah says the judge was on a power trip. Mom wants to picket the court. Hannah wants to pull in the governor and fuck this bitch up. It's hard to know who or what she's referring to as the bitch. Here's another call. She seems happy and is talking about cutting her friend's hair. Hannah's wishing that they had hula hoops in jail. Mom recommends writing a book about this whole thing before somebody else does. <laughs> Trying to get that bag. Here's another call. Hannah says that she already has been punished for this. Carmela, Bowles paralegal, says that she knows Hannah is sorry. Carmela says Carrie's lying about everything. Oh, no. Is it paralegal? No. They blame the child on set for being dangerous on set? They blame the child on set? I'm sorry. Who was the adult on the set? How old was Hannah again? I know she's like in her early 20s, but she was considered an adult. Why are you blaming the child? They blame the child on the set for being dangerous on set. Hannah talks about kids getting the gun that was just laying around on the ground. Well, first of all, why was the gun just laying around on the ground? Carmela tells Hannah, I don't trust Carrie to not be recording these calls. I don't trust that bitch. Wait, I'm so confused. Why would Carmela not think that the calls are recorded? Does she, is she just trying to fuck with Hannah? What is going on here? Hannah says if she has to stay in jail longer, she is going down for prison. Hannah says there is more to do in prison and talks about her going to Springer where she could ride horses. Here's another call. They talk about using her father's leukemia mm, to keep her out of prison. They want to say that her and her mom are the only people who can help her dad. Hannah talks about, oh, this is why, this is why Carrie Morrissey was like so disappointed in her. Hannah talks about her publicist and how it is time to make some statements from him. Here's another call. They talk about how it might work for Hannah if Hannah says that she's a sole caretaker for father. Hannah says jail isn't too bad and some parts of it are just fine. I mean, I'm sorry, just because you're a sole caretaker of someone doesn't mean that you're just going to get out of prison. Hello? Oh, boy. And then also, remember, Mr. Bowles, Hannah's attorney, went up there was just like, you know, like sometimes if you were to screen through someone's phone calls, yeah, I mean, they're not going to be perfect. They're going to say some things. This is not just saying some things. It's like there's a lot of shit in here. There's a lot of stuff in here. Another phone call. They talk about Hannah can do that time standing in her head. Hannah talks about her statement to the judge. Mom talks about saying something to the judge. Carmela apparently told her that she can say whatever she wants. Oh, she can say whatever she wants at sentencing. And the worst that can happen is spending a couple of days in jail. Why did the mom speak? Did they not allow the mom to speak or something during sentencing? Hannah asked Carmela to reach out to Helena's husband and son to support her at sentencing. Maybe they need to release his jailhouse calls. Hannah says jail is a forced vacation. She's doing fine. If she has to spend more time in jail, it will be okay. Here's another call. Hannah says the jury didn't look at the evidence and are assholes. Actually, hold on. Are these separate calls? I don't know if she would. Is she allowed to have this many calls? Or did they take like several calls and then broke it down to different file sizes? <laughs> Maybe that's what they did. 
Hannah says the jury didn't look at the evidence and are assholes. Hannah says the people that testified against her wanted to talk shit and get railroaded. Carrie lied in her closing statement. Hannah wants to go after the people for libel. Hannah's mad that the whole thing got pinned on her. Hannah says the jail is good character development. Hannah wants them to put Alec Baldwin in jail also. Hannah asked mom to tell the judge about Thel's leukemia diagnosis and how she takes care of him when mom isn't there. Hannah tells her mom what to say about how she takes care of Thel. Hannah says the jury is so fucking stupid and they couldn't tell what was happening. She calls the jury fucking idiots. Hannah says she doesn't feel like she deserves to be there and the jail guards agree with her. Hannah thinks the judge got paid off. They talk about the call being recorded and how they need to talk about people by their names instead of bitch. <laughs> So they do know the calls were recorded. <laughs> they complain about the time the jury took to deliberate and how they didn't look at the evidence. They talk about how she shouldn't be a felon and maybe they can get it knocked down to a misdemeanor. Hannah wants to bother the governor for the rest of her life so she can be pardoned. Hannah doesn't feel she should be a felon because she has never been arrested. Hannah says the judge wanted to lock her up. Hannah and her mom talk about how the system failed her. Hannah's having a movie night in jail watching Frozen. Hannah's boyfriend say that he's trying to quit smoking weed. Hannah says that she won't have anyone to smoke with, smoke weed with and that she's going to smoke weed when she gets out. Hannah's mother say that Hannah should fight the biggest girl of the bunch that is causing problems. <laughs> oh, man. Great influences. Great influences. Mom says she can't promise she'll be calm and cool with sentencing. Mom says she's going, oh, you know what? I wonder if Carrie Morrissey showed this to the judge um, and was like, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't have the mom at the sentencing. Just don't let her be there. Mom says she can't promise she'll be calm and cool with sentencing. Mom says she's going to go in disguise if they don't let her in. Well, do we see the mom? I don't think we did. Mom says it's lucky that all she did at the verdict was yell. Hannah says she got moved to 300 and it's fucking lit in here now. Hannah complains about the jail guards. Hannah was accused of passing notes to some male inmate and sparked some sort of investigation. Hannah says she has Regina as her roommate and it is fun as fuck, not bad at all. Hannah says she had a good day and fun with another inmate. Hannah says it is crazy good vibes today and everyone is having fun because they got their commissary. Hannah talks about some medication she got that made her loopy. She talks about working out. Hannah says she likes the new medication because it makes her feel high. Hannah complains about the jury instructions and Hannah doesn't understand why she is in there. Hannah says that this whole thing has been a character attack on her. Hannah complains that she has gone. Hannah complains that she has all the fame of a public figure, but none of the benefits. Oh my God, this is so horrible. Hannah says this is all she was going to be known for. Mom asks whether or not Helena's friends and family are going to write letters for her. Um, they didn't. Why would they? Hannah says she's nice and safe in jail. Hannah says that they are referring to law enforcement and prosecution don't even have all her supplies. So how could they pin it on her and that it is reasonable doubt enough? Oh, see, I don't know. She probably knows it was her fault, but maybe she thought they planned enough reasonable doubt for the jury to not convict. Mm. They talked about how much Hannah's life. They talk about how much of Hannah's life they could take up and that it is messing up her modeling career. I didn't even know she had a modeling career. I know it looks like she did like some amateur modeling, like when she was like way younger um, and thinner. But did she take up modeling again afterwards? <laughs> Hannah's sitting in jail. <laughs> let me go. Let me go. Hannah thinks the producer should be in jail. They complain, they complain about Dave Holtz and how he fucked Hannah to save his own ass. Possibly. She's so gross. I mean, look at the mom. When you have a parent like this that just enables your shitty behavior. <laughs> oh, my, I don't know. Maybe she didn't have a, she didn't stand a chance. Hannah is dismissive of a judge talking about someone dying as a result of her actions. Mm. Hannah talks about how she's in good spirits. Hannah says she's really fine in jail and some days she really likes it here. Hannah says the prosecution bored the juror for nine days and when the defense put their case, the jury was bored. They think the jury must have been tampered with. They feel let down by the FBI. Hannah says if the whole thing wasn't so comical, she would be upset. Mom yells that Hannah didn't cause Helena's death and Hannah agrees. Uh, Oh, God. Hannah and her boyfriend talk about Hannah drinking and how she is mean to him when she drinks. Yikes. Based on the time of their relationship, she had have to have violated her conditions because there is another call where they talk about being their six month anniversary. So she's also an angry drunk. Mega yikes. Hannah says she deserves a new trial and that this is bullshit. 
Hannah talks about her job at Mattress World and how she doesn't want her job back, but perhaps she does because she would need a job. Hannah wants to go on unemployment and she thinks that losing her job due to incarceration is the best way to get on unemployment. <laughs> Let me get that money. Hannah says she should be signed. There's like, this is so like, this, guys, I'm telling you, this is crazy. This is wild. This is so bad. I, they like barely even glazed it. Okay. When they talked about this during sentencing. Hannah says she should have signed a plea and that she and then just go on the news and denied it. Wait, Hannah says she should have signed the plea. Oh, and then gone on the news and denied it. So the uh, special attorney, uh, Carrie Morrissey, did offer Hannah a plea for a lesser um, for like a lesser sentencing. And Hannah said, no, I'm going to court. I didn't do it. So now she's like, oh, I should have just taken the plea, but then just go on the news and say that it wasn't me. <laughs> Hannah says she's looking at 13 months, which is ridiculous over what happened. Yeah. She's like, I feel bad. Like, I don't know. When she talks about the victims, Joel, Helena, and during her sentencing, like, that was just all performative. Just completely performative. Especially, like, with all the shit that we're hearing from the jailhouse calls. Yikes. Because I, I thought, like, her demeanor was off, you know, when she was um, during the police body cam, when they interrogated her the first time, interrogated her a second time. And then kind of like how her demeanor was when she was like sitting there in the courtroom. But I was like, yeah, you know, maybe it's just how she is. But no, she seems like a piece of shit. Like, honestly, just like a piece of shit. Hannah thinks a paramedic should be in jail for intubating her wrong. Hannah says, wait, so what's her logic here? So she thinks the paramedic should be in jail for intubating Helena incorrectly. Like they didn't do their job correctly. Why would not? Why would that not apply to her? I'm so confused. Courtney Cl yeah, Courtney Clenny is also a bad one, too. And the parents in that one. Yep, that's also another bad one. Uh, I mean, we got, what, Courtney Clenny. We got Hannah Reed. We got Sarah Boone. Who are the other entitled fucks? Hannah says mom can also give Carrie a two or three of her pay stubs to shut that bitch up. Hannah tells mom to get the ones where she has 38 to 40 hours so it shows that she has a full-time job and not the ones that show less. <laughs> oh the pay stubs oh my god so she's trying to like lie on her pay stubs i guess or she has pay stubs that shows her that like working full-time but maybe she's not completely full-time all the time <laughs> and i can't believe how many people are trying to ruin her i don't hannah you're just doing this yourself i'm sorry this is all you this is all you're doing Hannah says everyone thinks it's crazy she got locked up with her history. Hannah says she shouldn't be in jail because she has no priors. Hannah complains that they literally put her in there with murderers. Hannah says that people have accidents and people die. It's an unfortunate part of life, but it doesn't mean she should be in jail. She says the medic on the, on the set of Russ is a dumb bitch and should have been prepared. They talk about the paramedics taking too long and she would still be here today if they have done it right and not into... Oh my God. So she's literally just pointing the finger at anyone, everyone but her. She calls the paramedics fucking idiots, fucking retards. Mom says, how is that on you? <laughs> oh, what does the mom look like? Mom wonders if Carrie's going to be at sentencing. Uh, yeah, no shit. She's a special prosecutor. Mom says she don't want to see me. Mom says she don't need that bitch there. Hannah tells her that they all use the same bathroom as the public and chuckles. Oh, my God. Apparently, um, they her family made a GoFundMe for her. They made her a fucking GoFundMe after the verdict. Um, but GoFundMe, they shut that shit down. All right, that shit is gone. They shut it down. I wonder what happens though when the, you do make a GoFundMe for someone and it gets shut down. So as you're making a GoFundMe, are you slowly getting the money, or does it all get collected at once? Does anyone know how GoFundMe does it? Because I wonder if like that GoFundMe was being funded and they did get some money, or they just end up getting like nothing. <laughs> Man. all right well there we go that's that's a piece of shit for you i mean i for sure think those jailhouse calls might be released in the media i'll definitely keep an eye out for it uh these are summaries of the jailhouse calls so maybe the summaries are disingenuous and just make her look bad nah, i feel like the jailhouse calls are gonna be so bad uh, if they're ever released so yeah oh it gets refunded okay that's good Okay, that's good. Because I wasn't sure how the GoFundMe self uh, operates now. All right, y'all, that was Hannah Reed. We had our sentencing today. She got 18 months. The judge was like, mm -mm -mm. we're not going to release you. We're not going to put you in probation. Mm -mm. 
Uh, we went over this. Um, she also has another um, another pending case coming up. Hiding a fire, hi hiding a firearm, maybe in her butt cheeks or something. <laughs> Oh, man, just not a very smart person. Um, I did want to talk about Sarah Boone very quickly. Sarah Boone. Sarah Boone. So I think her judge does not think that, not the judge, I'm sorry. I think her attorney, her new attorney, her, is it seventh or eighth attorney? I don't know what attorney it's on. But it seems like her attorney does not believe they will have enough time to prepare for the trial date. Uh, because the trial date is set for, I think it was like May or June. Let's talk about Sarah Boone really quick. Yeah, that was bad. That was horrible. Oh, let's look at the poll. Um, poll. We have 217 votes. How, what should Hannah get? Max, 18 months, uh, 68%. 12 to 18 months, 16%. Probation or less than six months, 9%. Uh, six to 12 months, 5%. Hannah's mom. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, the Chad Daybell trial, uh, it seems like over the weekend, the judge has stepped up their audio and video game. So it looks a lot better. So I would definitely be tuning back into the Chad Daybell stuff. I, I, when they don't have good audio and when it's like, oh, I don't know, it's unbearable. The audio is a little bit better, but it's not really the greatest. I don't know. I think it's a little bit better. All right. So Sarah Boone stuff. Um, this is locked up. They had a hearing. Depositions. Seems like things are moving along for the Sarah Boone stuff. They're going to be taking depositions for um, some of the witnesses. They're going to get a psychologist. They're going to go for the uh, battered woman defense, I believe. I just have the court TV part. Okay. Court TV! We have an update on the suitcase murder trial that we expect to happen at some point in the case against Sarah Boone. We don't have a trial date yet, but she was in court. Wait, Sarah Boone, um, when's her date set again? Oh, canceled, canceled. Oh, was it for May? Oh, her hearing was set for, or her trial was set for May. What? I thought it was June. Okay, so it seems like we'll have a status hearing on June 7th. Let me write that down on my calendar. June 7th. June 7. Um, oh, June 7 is going to be Baldwin's trial too. June 7, status hearing for Boone. <laughs> Boone's like never going to have her trial. Jesus, she's just going to run in jail forever. <laughs> what? Murdoch betting 5K in the Super Bowl and losing? He's in real trouble with the prison population? Uh, where did you see that? Where did they report that? it's wild how bad the court well it's because the judge um was like doing their own like in-house like courtroom microphone and like zoom calls and whatever so uh, i wish he just like court tv or like law and crime or, or some news outlet just handle it but i don't know i don't know for today for a status hearing with her new attorney seventh or eighth attorney that she has she told the judge that she needed a little more time to agree <laughs> the granny who killed her son's ex over custody you mean donna adelson <laughs> At first, I was like, who's the granny? Uh, Donald Adelson, uh, July 22nd, there's a case management. And then uh, September 12th, some sort of like docket sounding. I don't know. Um, I know that Donna initially wanted to waive her, uh, like the speedy trial thing, but she's got a new attorney um, that's taking over her case, along with her son's attorney as well, the one that lost the case. But uh, yeah, that'll, that'll probably be a bit. Initially, she wanted things to go very quickly, but um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Because I thought it was going to be like the end of this year, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe maybe the end of this year. I'll look it up again. Because I remember she wanted to move some dates around because there's a Jewish hol what's I don't know, there's a Jewish holiday that was happening and she wanted to make sure that um, it wouldn't clash with the Jewish holiday. But then she was like, if it were to clash, um, I don't want to reschedule for a later date. I want it to happen sooner. I don't know. I just remember hearing that about Donna. Court TV has lost count. I know I have too. Although I don't know, seven or eight, I don't know which attorney it is on anymore. <laughs> Agree on that new trial date. This after multiple public and private lawyers have quit, causing a long string of delays in this case. The judge did set the next status hearing in that case for June seventh. I um, I new attorney right here. 
Obviously, I'm not going to be ready for trial in May. We had discussed that on the day of the appointment. I've got depositions set on May 7th, and there are likely to be pretrial motions that will need to be filed. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that completely wrong. Granny who killed her son's ex. Um, I don't know if I'm familiar with that case. What's the name of it? The Oklahoma Granny. Oh, I don't know if I'm familiar with that one. The state was asking that the status hearing be in 60 days. At that time, I think we'll be closer to being able to inform the court what we believe will be a trial date that we'd be ready for. I've hired an expert. And yeah, so Sarah Boone. Oh, there she is right there. Hello, Sarah Boone. Sarah Boone has a new judge, new attorney. <laughs> and a number of things are dependent on completion of her evaluation and where we're going to go from there in the case. Sarah Boone is charged with the death of her boyfriend who died while trapped inside a zipped up suitcase. She claimed they were playing a game of hide and seek and didn't know he was stuck, but investigators discovered something. I wonder if she's going to change her defense. Can she? Cause she's like, you know what? I panic and I lied. I'm sorry. That's not the truth. Let me, let me just tell you guys the real truth. Cause for, I think for her to go up to the jury and then give that defense, it's going to look so, 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 so bad. Like, oh, we're just playing hide and seek. Like, oops, I forgot about him. I didn't realize until the next morning that he was still there. Why, why did it take me forever to call? I, won't, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Whew. I don't know what's going to happen with her. That's going to be a hot mess. Cell phone video of Boone taunting Jorge Torres while he was pleading to be let out of the suitcase. How did he fit inside? I mean, it's a pretty big suitcase. And I think the guy is like, um, it looked pretty small. But he probably like bottled up or something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, what's going on with Mike? Um, what's his name again? Channing Tatum and Jenna Dewan. Uh, this is like a article that I wanted to read on my own. Okay, so Sarah Boone, uh, we're going to push her out to June 7. June 7. Um, Hannah Reed sentencing. We had that happen already. Let me delete that. Free trial stuff for Sickle Stearns um, in regards to the Madeline Soto case. That's going to be this month, but... I mean, they haven't charged him with murder yet, so I don't know what's going on with that. I mean, they're probably still doing their investigation and all that, but ooh, what a super sad case for that one. Oh, uh, still waiting. I'm telling you, Boone isn't deserving of the lawyer than the world-renowned lawyer, Daryl Brooks. You mean the shock shackles? <laughs> Hi, Rain. How are you doing today? How's it going? No! What? I was zipping the suitcase and left. Oh, my God. That sounds horrible. Oh, my God. I want to throw up. It was my earliest memory. I could still feel and see. Oh, my God. Who did that? That's so fucked up. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's horrible. Okay, Granny and Granny's boyfriend and neighbor and wife killed son's ex and a court-appointed supervisor who was a wife and mom also? Do you have the name? I don't know. I don't know. I haven't heard of that one. I heard of one that was like similar. It was like a Las Vegas one. Uh, there was a Las Vegas one where there was a woman who was having a very horrible, contentious divorce with her husband. Um, they were fighting over the kids. I think there are more than one kids. And she and her new lawyer, who was also her boyfriend, went to go take a deposition at the law firm. But here's the thing. Her ex-husband wasn't an attorney or is an attorney. And the, the husband's uh, father is also an attorney. So initially, she was a little bit hesitant about taking the deposition because she didn't want her husband to be there because like, apparently her husband is like unhinged or something like that. But then she found out that her husband wasn't going to be there. So she goes with her boyfriend slash attorney to go take the deposition. And it ends up being the husband's father who fucking shot the both of them. Just kills both of them. And he was also, he's an attorney. He was taking the deposition or something. So fucking crazy. Um, I think that was like in Vegas. But that sounds very similar to what you're talking about, Fionn. But um, the Oklahoma Fort, yeah, I'm not quite sure about that. I don't know if I heard about that. Yikes. Um, 
Okay, so we have, yeah, so boon trial. I'm going to delete that. Boon pre-trial. We'll delete that. Well, at least there's not too much going. Oh, actually, you know what? There's a lot of stuff that I want to cover. I want So I know that, like, the Frankie and the Jody Hildebrand stuff, I, I think I said, like, last year was probably going to be the last one. But you know what? It's not going to be the last one. Um, there's some new stuff that I wanted to cover with the Jody Hildebrand and Ruby Frankie stuff. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow maybe i'll come back tomorrow and do that but i wanted to cover some of that stuff and then apparently um their eldest um ruby frankie's eldest son uh chad frankie he streams on twitch he was playing Fortnite or something and he was doing like a q a session uh with the, the audience so i don't know i was gonna take a look at that and just check it out as well i think it was like a two-hour stream um i have not looked at it yet but i looked at the summary of what they talked about um give us a sample <laughs> This ain't no ice cream. You don't get no free samples in here. What, what do you want a sample of? Let me delete this. Yeah, so maybe we'll do that tomorrow. Um, so today we covered Hannah Reed. We talked about Sarah Boone. Um, yeah, tomorrow I want to talk about Ruby Frankie, Jody Hildebrand. Uh, I want to talk about a video that was shared on my Discord about Paige Hannah. Um, she came, she resurrected the the YouTube channel, I guess, and then um, she talked about Jody Hildebrand. So I want to listen to that with you guys. <laughs> what was Jody? No, no, let's not talk about Jody and hide anything. <laughs> oh. Oy, oy, oy. Okay, so I think we'll do that tomorrow then. So I'll be back again tomorrow. Um, I'm not going to start as early as today, but I do want to try to start early. Maybe, I don't know, maybe like 10 or 11. Nah, let's, let's keep it real. Hold on, maybe like 11. Wait, do I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow? I don't think so, right? Yeah, maybe I'll start like 11 o'clock tomorrow, my time, Pacific time. And then um, we'll do some Ruby Frankie, Jody Hildebrand stuff. Um, Kevin Frankie is also suing uh, Jody Hildebrand. I couldn't get a hold of the, the, the lawsuit. So if anyone has a copy of that, can you guys send it over to me? I tried finding a copy of it. I couldn't get a hold of it. I just have like news media outlets that are just quoting it. But I want to get like the, the copy of the lawsuit. Um, so if you guys have it, please uh, put it in the Discord in the True Crime section. Feel free to join the Discord as well if you haven't already. Uh, like the stream. And um, I don't know, follow the social media stuff. Um, I make videos on TikTok, uh, YouTube, and then we stream games on Twitch. I don't know. That's about it. <laughs> That's about it. All right, let me catch up with some of your guys' messages. The kids are 8 and four, 10 years old. Are they psychopaths now? I'm just kidding. I know kids sometimes do, like, really cruel shit. That's when you get back from work? Yay! Yeah. Thanks for the stream. Yeah, guys, uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Just a little recap today's stream. Uh, we talked about Hannah Reed Gutierrez's uh, sentencing. We watched the sentencing. We listened to victim impact statements from Helena's friends, family members, and we went over the jailhouse calls. Okay, the jailhouse calls were really bad. Maybe we'll get to listen to the actual audio tapes. I don't know if the state's going to release those. They should, because I'm curious and nosy. But uh, from reading what the state summarized, it already sounded really effing bad. Um, and then we talked about Sarah Boone as well. It seems like her stuff has been delayed again. Her attorney thinks she needs more time, which is understandable because when did she get a new attorney? Like a couple, was it like the beginning of this year or uh, was it the beginning of this year where she got a new attorney? I think so. February, March, something like that. So it's understandable that the current attorney wants new time. We'll see what happens with that. And yeah, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll talk about Jody Hildebrand, Ruby Frankie, Kevin Frankie, Paige Hannah, and all that stuff. And it shouldn't be too much of a long stream, I don't think. I think we could probably finish the stream pretty quick tomorrow. Uh, shouldn't be a long one. But if y'all missed any parts of today's stream, um, I will have today's stream chopped up. I know last week or the, the past couple streams, I have not been chopping them up. I've just been really lazy. <laughs> i've just been lazy and i'm like you know what having on the stream is good enough um yeah so i didn't and also the uh the opening statements for daybell was like the audio was like meh and then the apple river stuff i was just being really fucking lazy but if you guys want to watch any of the apple river um stabbings we covered it last week all the streams are up we did listen to chat daybell's opening statements that's up as well as a stream but i'm not gonna chop those up and turn into a video i'm just lazy just lazy <laughs> But anyways, y'all, I hope you guys have a good one. Um, I will chop today's stream. Um, take care of yourself, okay? I hope you guys, uh, I don't know, go outside, get some sunshine, and yeah. Bye. Have a good one. Uh, for Twitch, though, Twitch. Hold on, let me end the YouTube run. Bye, YouTube people. I'm going to end my YouTube stream. See ya.